Okay, we're recording. Thank you. Um, good evening. It is January 9th of the new year. Um, it, this is a regular meeting of the town council and in, in a, just a few moments, we'll include the election of officers. On November 7th, 2022, an act was signed into law which extends the suspension of certain provisions of the open meeting law. This allows us to continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically present. But I would like to point out that tonight we have nine counselors in the room and we welcome you all, 10, 10 counselors in the room. Thank you. Um, this meeting is accessible in real time by Zoom, by phone, in person, because we are allowed to have an audience and on Amherst Media. In fact, we welcome two people to the audience tonight. Thank you. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the January 9th, 2023 town council meeting to order at 6.35. I'll call upon each counselor by name. At that time, you should unmute your mic and say present. This will indicate that you can hear us and we can hear you. Please remember to then mute your mic again. Shalini Balmilne. I'm present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Jo Haneke. Present. Anika Lopes. Present. Michelle Miller. Present. Dorothy Pam. Here. Pam Rooney. Present. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer uh, Jennifer Todd. Present. Alicia Walker. Present. Thank you. There's no chat room for this meeting. If you have technical issues, please let Athena and me know and uh, we will do what we can uh, to correct that. If you want to make a comment or ask a question, please click the raise hand button. Um, and later on, we will go through uh, any other announcements. With that, I am going to turn this over to the clerk. Uh, I would like to note that at this point, there are 19 people as panelists and 24 people in the audience on Zoom, and I'm sure there are many others watching this on Amherst Media. Athena? Thank you, President Griesmer. <clears throat> I'm just gonna go over the procedures for electing the president briefly, and then we'll get started. So first I'll open the floor for nominations. The nominations don't require a second. Counselors may nominate themselves. Um, when a counselor is nominated, they'll be asked if they accept the nomination. When there are no further nominations, uh, I will ask the nominees if they'd like to make a statement. They have up to two minutes. And then other counselors will have an opportunity to make a comment for up to two minutes, just one comment each. And then for those of you in the room, you each have a little stack of written ballots. I'll collect your written ballots. And for those of you on Zoom, you'll send your votes via email. Um, I'll tally the votes and announce the results and swear in the president. If a nominee doesn't receive seven votes, then we'll begin the process again with accepting nominations. Are there any questions before we get started? Okay, I'm opening the floor for nominations. Councillor Pam? Um, I nominate Lynn Griesmer. Lynn, do you accept your nomination? I do. Are there any other nominations? Anika? I was going to nominate Lynn as well. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other nominations? All right, Lynn, you have an opportunity to make a statement for two minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you. First, I'd like to thank all of you for understanding and supporting throughout this year. Uh, there seems to be many bad examples of governing in the country right now, but frankly, with our spirit of cooperation, I think we stand out as a, as a group of people that can, in fact, govern. In the, years ahead, in the year ahead, we have much to do. That includes advancing the goals we've set for the town manager. Well, we haven't quite set them yet, but we're getting there. And making sure that we support our diverse community and our town staff from the town manager through all departments. In the coming year, we have many critical issues that we will all need to work on together. First and foremost, 
is the passage of a debt exclusion override for a new elementary school. This is not a one person job. This is a many person job. We need to determine our next steps regarding the Jones Library, make progress on DPW, fire and EMS, and many other capital issues. In addition to that, we have to balance a budget. We have to update and pass some bylaws and regulations, many of which we discussed in the State of the Town Address. And we may be seeking special legislation. It's quite a list and only scratches the surface. Another goal for the coming year is helping the council to do its work efficiently and effectively. In part, that simply involves the mechanics of how we all approach our meetings, focus on priorities, use time wisely, and ask ourselves if more re really needs to be said. It also means recognizing the district, distinct roles of the council, the manager, other boards and committees. For the council president especially, it means helping each of you achieve your goals by, hearing, by learning what you want to accomplish and helping you bring your issues forward, even if I don't agree with them. Often that can mean asking for amendments and motions in advance. Please help Athena and me to do this. With that, I've run out right two minutes. Thank you, Lynn. Um, I'm just gonna go through each counselor by name and ask if there are any comments. So you'll have up to two minutes if you'd like to make a comment. Shalini? No. Uh, Pat? No. Anna? Mandy? No. Um, Anika? Michelle? I just want to say thank you, Lynn, for your willingness to um, run for this role again. It's a really challenging position. And um, although we've made a lot of progress, you've um, led us through a challenging year. So I very, very much thank you. And also um, the piece that you said about helping counselors to reach their goals. Um, I feel really grateful to you for your capacity to do that. And I have felt that personally. So thank you. Dorothy? Uh, Pam? Kathy? Uh, yeah, I just, um, Lynn, I think you've already heard this and you said it in your statement, but the one area that I think we all can improve on is our agendas and the time spent in meetings. And uh, to me, that's in part, if there are just too many items and any of them need intense discussion, uh, come back to us and say, add a meeting or spread out the length of time. I mean, I, I just, we, we, we often are doing things that I don't think we have to do at that time. Sometimes we can't avoid it, but since you are more in control of figuring that out than the rest of us, we would all appreciate it if we can do that this year. Got it. Andy? Jennifer? Um, I'll say no, and also heeding Lynn's advice of, does more really need to be said? <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> Alicia, would you like to make a statement? No, thank you. Okay. So for those of you in the room, please fill out your paper ballots. And those of you online, please email your response to my email asking for your vote. Just waiting on one more response. Uh, 
The vote was 12 in favor, none against, and one abstention. Councillor Balmeln voted for Griesmer. DeAngelis voted for Griesmer. Devlin Gauthier voted for Griesmer. Griesmer voted for Griesmer. Haneke voted for Griesmer. Lopes voted for Griesmer. Mil Miller voted for Griesmer. Pam voted for Griesmer. Rooney voted for Griesmer. Shane voted for Griesmer. Steinberg voted for Griesmer. Taub voted for Griesmer. And Walker abstained. Congratulations, Lynn. I'm going to come over and swear you in. Swear me in. <laughs> Do you solemnly swear or affirm to faithfully and impartially perform all duties incumbent upon you as council president? I do. For the town of Amherst. Thank you. Congratulations. Thanks. So I'm just going to do one small little paragraph because I think it sums up what some of you have just said to me as well. If there's a single goal that sums up my hopes for the year ahead, it is to focus on what unites us in strengthening our community. Amherst is a remarkable place with a deep reservoir of commitment to progress. We are eager to move forward and to serve as a positive example, but it doesn't happen by itself. The council sets the tone and frames the agenda. There will always be differences, but if we can model how to move forward despite those differences, the community will respond. Thank you. So now I get to run the nominations for vice president. So uh, again, we'll go through the same process. I'll ask for nominations. Uh, the nominations do not require a second. Councilors may nominate themselves. And each council, each after each nomination, I will ask the councilor nominated if they accept the nomination. And then we'll go through the same process. Pat DeAngelis, you have your hand up. Yeah, I nominate Councilor Devlin Galtier. Okay. Anna, do you accept the nomination? I do. Uh, Alicia, you have your hand up. Um, thank you. I would like to nominate Councillor Michelle Miller. Michelle, do you accept the nomination? Yes. Okay. Um, are there any further nominations for the position of vice president? Then we're going to ask each of the nominees to make a brief statement. Uh, and of two minutes. We'll start with Anna Devlin Gothier. Thank you. The role of vice president is an interesting one. On paper, it's one sentence. The vice president shall proceed, preside in the absence of the president. What I have found over the past year is that the role of vice president depends on how the person in the role approaches the collaborative work of this council. While she has not needed it often, I have stepped in for the president, both at meetings and town events. I have also seen through, uh, seen through opportunities for increased transparency and awareness with counselors. I have encouraged more frequent and written president's reports, including a list of meetings the president has attended. I have expanded participation in meetings with our legislators and created opportunities for the council to share any specific topics they would like to see addressed prior to those meetings. Currently, I'm working with the president to expand those opportunities to engage with our legislators as a council. I attend agenda setting meetings and raise my voice to ensure that the direction of the council reflects the perspectives of all 13 of us, regardless of my own or the president's point of view. I bring a level-headed and informed approach. I seek to understand and I remove my ego from the work we do. I come prepared. I welcome feedback. I challenge and I push back without an agenda of my own in service of moving items through our process. I am comfortable with disagreement and I do not let it cloud my eagerness for collaborative work. We need to be able to work with people who we have disagreed with even vehemently in the past. I have done that and I will continue to do that. The vice president must help to move items forward. They must have a clear understanding of the rules, the processes, and the issues, and be able to collaborate with and work with all members and take into account their learnings. I have shown that in the past year, and I look forward to your trust, support, and feedback in continuing to deepen and demonstrate that in the year ahead. Thank you. Okay. Michelle? 
It's a hard act to follow. Um, and I want to say that my decision, first and foremost, um, to run for vice president tonight is not at all meant to undermine Anna's leadership. Um, I think that Anna has done a fantastic job. I nominated Anna, um, and I think Anna would continue to do a fantastic job if elected tonight. Um, the reason that I have chosen to run is I was approached, um, you know, over the past month or so by a few members of the community. Um, and then more recently um, been approached by more members of the community asking uh, for me to step up into this role. Um, so I will say from the one line official standpoint of what the vice president does, I do have the pri privilege of time. So I am in a position if it were ever needed um, to step into the role of president. I also believe that I bring the skill set and experience to chair. So I've learned so much chairing the African Heritage Reparation Assembly and the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee. I believe I am a fair and honest um, chair and, and diligent chair of those committees. But the more unofficial leadership role that the vice president plays is what I wanted to talk a little bit more about. Um, and to say that I believe that I would bring balance. Um, so our wonderful leadership team over the past year has done an excellent job of leading. However, on most issues, they have voted the same and they ha have held similar, if not the same views. And so what I believe that I would bring as the VP is um, a healthy balance. Um, and uh, it, I, I believe that it would be generative and healthy for the council to have um, my leadership um, in the vice president role. I also uh, bring a very healthy sense of engagement and healthy and diligent engagement, I believe. Um, I um, have very good connections in the community. I have earned the trust of many members of the community that have otherwise felt unheard. And I believe this year that's going to be particularly important, especially as we move forward with this debt exclusion um, and asking our community to step uh, to, to to approve a vote so that we can have our beautiful new school. Um, so I would uh, imagine myself being an arm there and working alongside other counselors as well as community members to move that. And of course, all of the other uh, goals that we have as a council. So thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask the town clerk. I mean, I'm sorry, the clerk of the council. Uh, if she will call the roll and each counselor, excluding the nominees, may make a brief statement on the election of the vice president. Shalini? She shook her head no. Pat? Yeah, I want to um, acknowledge Michelle's hard work this year, but I also uh, recognize <clears throat> In Anna, there is uh, a fiercely independent young woman um, who has really driven herself into the work of the council and has flourished there. She is collaborative. Uh, and that's something that many of us are struggling with. Uh, we think we are, but we leave uh, partnerships when something else uh, uh, makes us angry at another counselor. I don't see that happening uh, from Anna. What I see is someone who's dedicated to working uh, with everybody on the council. I see somebody who calls Lynn to task in the best possible way. And I see someone that I know that I can go to uh, to clarify issues that I'm struggling with, uh, issues where we disagree as well as issues where we agree. I think she, you are a gift 
as many of the new counselors are a gift to this council. And I hope that you'll make it to vice president again. Lynn? I decline at this point to say anything. Mandy? So I want to echo everything that Pat just said. Um, and I want to add um, to my support for Anna that in four years or three years of prior vice presidents, two of myself and one of Evan who tried to get Lynn to open up meetings, <laughs> Anna's been the only one that has been able to do so. And that I think shows a fierce um, ability on Anna's behalf to help this council become more transparent and to bring more names and more views into the room and other any room. And so it's one of the reasons I'm going to support Anna. Anika? No. Um, Dorothy? Um, well, first of all, I will say that this is not about whether Anna has been doing a good job. This is really about a sense of balance and perception of the public of the council. Um, people talk to us all the time and they see a council which seems to be divided in a certain way and votes can be predicted with great accuracy on most issues. Uh, many of us are concerned about who is going to run in the future for the council. The public has seen meetings that go on and on and on with issue after issue and they Every, I think everyone in one of us in this room have people come up to you all the time and say, thank you for your service. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your work because they see how much work it is. So in terms of making the job or the, a, a more friendly kind of thing, I think it would be better if it weren't seen as quite so political. And I know this sounds kind of contradictory, but one way to make it seem less political, less like a well-oiled machine is in fact to acknowledge that there are often two sides, three sides, four sides to an issue, and that uh, having Michelle as vice president would be opening that up. So um, that is really the, uh, uh, the light in which I am supporting Michelle. Both are young women who are incredibly intelligent, tremendously hardworking, and to, to be trusted, okay? But I'm talking about a perception of more balance in the community. So thank you. Pam? I think Dorothy said what I was going to say pretty, pretty well. I really thank Anna for all the hard work this year. Um, I look for an opportunity to, um, I've watched Michelle in her, in her dealings, and she is so overtly inclusive that I think it is, um, it is probably the characteristic that, that I think we need for the year going forward. Kathy? I'll pass. Andy? So I, this is uh, going to be one of the most difficult uh, votes that I'm going to have to take probably tonight. So I just want to say that uh, we're choosing two, between two very good people who are seeking this position. And I have worked with both of them in some capacity this year that I can um, really speak from the experience that I've had with Anna on TSO and uh, watching how uh, she has uh, taken on the role of um, helping TSO to analyze and work through some incredibly complex um, topics that weren't always very interesting, but required somebody to do a lot of work. Uh, and uh, in, in particular, I'm gonna pick on the water and sewer regulations because she broke them into um, pieces and enabled us to talk about each piece and understand each piece as we go through. And Michelle, who has done some uh, extraordinary work, I just complimented her the other day on the even-handed manner in which she ran the last GOL meeting when she was trying to 
help us get through a topic that's not yet completed, which is the town manager goals. Um, so we have two very good candidates. I'm going to um, stick with the right to have a secret ballot vote, but I wanted to just say that I am going to uh, vote for one of the candidates, but I want both candidates to know that I think very highly of them and uh, hope to work collegially as a council together, however this ends. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, <clears throat> I would echo Pam, uh, Dorothy, and Andy, although I, I haven't been on TSO. I, I have said it in meetings, it's incredible how quickly you move the sewer and water. I've never seen anything go that fast um, through the council. Um, but I, 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 I do think that there is um, a need for balance and that that would be that the community um, would appreciate that in the leadership of the council. And um, I have been on GOL and have um, thoroughly admired um, Michelle's leadership on that committee. And um, I think, you know, she always, with a very gentle touch, really holds her own and is um, always seeking a way to um, reach collaboration. Uh, but like Andy said, um, both are terrific candidates. Alicia. Uh, thank you, Athena. Um, so I first want to echo something that Dorothy said in terms of um, explaining that my decisions here tonight don't have much to do with um, whether or not I think previous leadership did a good job. I think we can all recognize the huge amount of work and dedication and commitment that goes into this work in general, but also like especially within the leadership in this kind of role. Um, so I do wanna recognize that I, I do thank Lynn and Anna for their leadership for the past year. It's an incredible amount of work and incredible dedication. Um, and in general, for me, um, in my point of view, the greatest amount of change and success in any given environment happens when there are many different viewpoints at the table, many different interests that are represented. Um, and I think that that goes the same for leadership. Um, and so I also wanna recognize that no two people have the exact same views or preferences. And so I think that my hope for tonight and for the council in general is for there to be more diversity. And I mean that in terms of diversity in general, but in terms of thought and process and perspective. And I want to see different people step up into leadership roles. And I want to see this council support the ability for many different kinds of people to be able to hold leadership roles. Um, and so in general, again, what I would like to see for this council is that we never just put one person as the leader all of the time. I want to see a rotation. I want to see different people step up and take on that role. I want to see us make changes to the guidelines and the governing rules so that more people can take leadership roles. Um, and so that is really going to be guiding my vote tonight in terms of wanting to see new people be involved in leadership. Thank you. We've completed the, okay, thank you. Uh, so at this point, if you're in the room, please use your paper ballot. If you're on Zoom, please send an email to Athena.
The vote is eight to four. I have for Anna Devlin Gothier, uh, Balmilne, DeAngelis, Haneke, Lopes, Devlin Gothier, Griesmer, Shane, and Steinberg. And for Miller, I have Walker, Miller, Pam, Rooney, and Taub. Congratulations, Anna. I'm going to come over and swear you in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm to faithfully and impartially perform all duties and coming upon you by your election as vice president for the town council for the town of Amherst? Yes. Yeah. Thank you all for participation and it's time to move forward with the rest of our agenda. We're moving on to announcements, which is agenda item two. Um, we have several upcoming meetings. I wanna point out particularly a couple. One is on the 23rd of this month, we have our next council meeting, but we will actually begin at 530 with the elementary school building project as a special session where we will have a presentation about the project, a presentation about the cost estimates, and looking at the time frame for decision-making for the council and the community. Uh, we also just wanna mention that uh, the Community Resources Committee, which is meeting on January 12th, is going to also be a joint meeting with the Finance Committee, thus making the Committee of the Whole. That will be at 5.30. Uh, in your packet is the annual report that's required from the Oliver Smith elector. And I just wanna make sure you notice that there are several flyers in there about various kinds of ways in, the, in which the elector offers gifts to widows, new brides, et cetera, okay? Uh, and then finally, we have four, or actually five big events coming up. The first is the African Heritage Reparations Assembly listening session. And this is the committee Michelle has been chairing. Uh, they are meeting at 6.30, it is by Zoom, and it's a listening session. It's their second of two listening sessions. And they will be also coming forward with their report to us sometime this spring. Uh, the second is this Sunday in this room, it is Celebration of Life and Legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King. It's from two to four. There is no Zoom link, but it will be in this room, okay? And I wanna just mention that counselors, I'll be polling you tomorrow. Uh, we have a resolution coming up, but they, we would also, they, we've also been invited to participate in the reading of Dr. King's speech, a realistic look at the question of progress in the area of race relations. The next item is the National Day of Healing, and this is being sponsored uh, by our DEI office. I should mention that the previous one is also being sponsored by uh, our Human uh, Rights Commission. Uh, the DEI is, and others are working together to sponsor the, uh, an event that will be at the Amherst Survival Center in North Amherst. Uh, it's from 6.30 to eight. It includes the options for childcare, uh, beverages and snack, and it's part of a nationwide effort that's being developed for a National Day of Healing. And then finally, uh, the Elementary School Building Committee is going to be doing two community forums. Uh, those are on January 25th at 8.30 a.m. and January 26th at 6.30 p.m., and those are by Zoom. Thank you. We have no hearings. So we're done with that. We're going to move to public comment. This is the only public comment this evening. If you would like to make public comment and you're in the room, please go over to where Athena is and sign up. Okay? That's over against there. 
uh, if you would like to make public comment and you are in the Zoom audience, please raise your hand at this time. Let's begin with the Zoom participant first, if that's okay. Yes, hold on. I'm showing that there are two people in the room who would like to make public comment, and there are eight people in the audience that would like to make public comment. Um, we'll start out with three minutes, uh, but I just want to ask that if at all possible, uh, you keep it below that. Um, Athena will call on people and they will make their public comment. The council will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during general public comment. Okay, Athena. First, we'll take John Root. As you come into public comment, please state your name where you live. John Root, please go ahead and unmute and make your comment. Okay, let's come back to John Root. Uh, next in the room is Edith Allison. Edith, please come up to the microphone. You can state your name, where you live, and then go ahead with your comment. Hello. My name is Edith Allison. I live on Bay Road. Um, I guess this is repetitive for you all, but I did want to thank you for your work. Looks like you work very, very hard. Um, I'm here to speak for the climate goals. Um, thinking of our future as one of the voiceless voices, the people who aren't born, who aren't here yet, um, and I, I appreciate that you all are thinking, obviously you're working for the larger community. So um, I so much support that, that you're doing that and wanna speak as a member of Mothers Out Front and also Grace Church's next door um, environmental group. Um, we're very much behind the efforts to do what we can in leadership in our town uh, to be part of our the leadership of the Commonwealth. I know other states look to us. They have trigger uh, legal bills and they look to us. Um, and within our Commonwealth, it's very inspiring when our different towns um, urge each other forward. <clears throat> so I'm thanking you for thinking of the future and, and for those voiceless voices. And I'm reminding myself of some of the inspiring people from our area, Sojourner Truth and Stan Zomek. Um, people who really think about a really large community. Um, and I thank you for your work. Thank you for coming out this evening and joining us. Great. Right, I'm going to try John Root again. John Root, are you there? John, you need to unmute. Okay, I'm gonna try Allegra Clark. Hello, my name is Allegra Clark. I'm a resident of District Two. Um, I am joining tonight um, as a individual member not speaking on behalf of the Community Safety Social Justice Committee, of which I'm the co-chair. Um, but I just wanted to briefly voice support for the town manager goals around racial equity and personnel management. Um, 
to include um, starting with the police department. I know that there has been talk about incorporating that into all public safety departments. And I know that the overall goal is for all departments to include that work and that culture shift. And I do think that that is important. I also think that it is important to recognize the precedent of the motion that was passed on November 14th um, that was introduced by Councillor Walker that did indicate that the town manager should work with the police first. Um, I, I think there are a few reasons why public safety as a whole, the three departments shouldn't be specified. And I think one of them is that the backbone of Crest has been anti-racism work. So everything that they are doing and everything they have done from the start is rooted in anti-racism. And I think that um, the event that was just shown, the racial healing event next week um, with Crest sponsoring some of the small group discussions, I think that is an excellent example of an anti-racist culture working in the community. Um, so, so part of me is saying that, that, that Cress is already doing the work of anti-racism and part of me is saying that the police should be there hand in hand and should be proud to be included and, and maybe the, you know, the second pioneering department of these efforts. Um, I think Councillor Walker has pointed out many times that the police have a different relationship with the community and that they're out in the community, they're in people's homes they have the power to arrest people and an arrest has the power to ruin somebody's life. Um, and I, that might sound like hyperbole, but it will affect your employment opportunities, education opportunities, housing opportunities. You can lose all of those opportunities if you have contact with the criminal legal system. So I think that framework is what should be guiding the town manager goals related to that specific item. Um, and I have two seconds, I did a good job, thanks. Thank you. Next in the room, we have Lucy Robinson. Thank you and good evening. And I'm excited to be here because um, I understand that um, you are going to be facing climate change issues and have some good ideas about things that really need to get going right now for the sake of us, for the sake of our kids, for the sake of our grandkids and on. And um, I know that we're a really intelligent community that will really understand how desperately needed any changes are that we're gonna to have to make many changes. And I want you to know that um, so many people in the town are really behind you and really see the changes we're going to have to make, some of which are little, some of which are huge. And I hope as you deliberate later in the year, whenever you start working on it, um, we'll hold the hopes for all the families in this town and for the world are, are going to be in your hands. And uh, there's no getting around that. So I think, uh, thank you very, very much for all the work you're doing and all the work you'll be doing and know that you are very supported in the community in this effort. Thank you very much. Again, thank you for joining us in the room tonight. Next is Felicia Mednick. Hi, thank you. I'm Felicia Mednick of 137 State Street in District 1. I'm a part of Mothers Out Front, um, which is also a member of the Amherst Climate Justice Alliance. And I want to first thank the town council for coming up with some thoughtful, impactful, and clear climate goals. We, as human beings, have to take serious measures if we're going to meet the growing climate crisis. And we, as Amherst, through our example, are leading the way for other towns to follow. I'm especially glad for the good working relationship the council is demonstrating with the Energy and Climate Action Committee and I'm also grateful to their expertise. There are three goals I would like you to reconsider adding to the goals that have been proposed and they, they were recommended by the Energy and Climate Action Committee. These particular ones focus on planning, 
First is to develop a plan to increase the pace of retrofitting multifamily complexes, especially those serving low and moderate income families with the goal of at least one project next year. I think this will show our commitment to climate justice by ensuring that not only wealthier people will benefit from homes with higher energy efficiency. And of course, the ECAC and Sustainable Ability Director will be intimately, intimately involved with this project. Second is to support planning for the creation of a building energy benchmarking and disclosure bylaw. This, I think, is a way of encouraging landlords and homeowners to take action in retrofitting their own buildings. When consumers can see how high their energy bills might be, landlords and homeowners may increase their energy efficiency efforts because less energy efficient dwellings may become less desirable. Third is to re-examine the bike and pedestrian plan submitted by the Transportation Advisory Committee and strengthen it. Lastly, as I previously spoke about in the meetings of other town budget, I would love for more money to go to the town sustainability director and department. I think this department will be able to bring in much funding to the town as the Inflation Reduction Act grants become increasingly available, which they soon will. And I also want to thank you so much for your attention and all your work. Thank you. Uh, Darcy Dumont. Good evening. Can you hear me? We can. Great. Uh, my name is Darcy Dumont, and I live in the new District 3. Uh, I think you've heard that uh, to accelerate climate action, we need to continually add to the town manager climate action goals and funding in order to meet the climate action goals adopted in 2019 and that we need additional staffing in order to implement what we have on our plates now. Please support the addition of the three new initiatives put forward by the Energy and Climate Action Committee that Felicia Mednick just mentioned that, and that are also being supported by the Emmers Climate Justice Coalition. In addition, very importantly, it's absolutely necessary to replace the first sentence of the climate action goals by putting back the reference to the 2019 town council goals, which has prefaced the climate action goals every year and is the basis for action. Uh, and to require a written plan as to how the town manager is going to fulfill the goals adopted by the council. Um, this sentence is recommended in our, in our written comment that we have already submitted. I'm also still concerned about the budget guidance letter and believe it should be reconsidered. We need a strong commitment to capital funds for climate action in the FY24 budget. We need a statement of commitment and a progression of capital funds dedicated to climate action in order to meet our 2025 climate action goal of 25% greenhouse gas emission reduction. In fact, we need a climate action stabilization fund like Northampton's to finance the upgrading of our fleet and buildings and to provide matching funds for all the grants that, that came available less than a week ago from the Inflation Reduction Act. I'm hoping that our recently established capital stabilization fund can be used for that purpose. Uh, and looking at the bigger picture, we also need a commitment to a humane amount of funding per capita in our operating budget so that we can have the staffing that we need to fulfill our policy goals. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment, Darcy. Next is Demetria Shabazz. Hello, I'm Demetria Shabazz. I live in South Amherst on Chapel Road. One of the ways to address the significantly lower levels of trust and confidence for police among many people of color here nation nationwide is to create a program that continually reinforces that officers must behave impartially and without bias. 
This through research has shown to help in changing and supporting a more anti-racist culture within the police. What that means is the creation of equality in society. We must commit to making unbiased choices and being anti-racist in all aspects of our lives. And beginning with the police force, which historically emerged out of the control and surveillance of black bodies during slavery. That is where we should begin. Even the best departments are hard pressed to escape that deeply damaging legacy. The CSWG and their exhaustive research and outreach shown that not only is there an issue of perception with the APD, which has been uh, earned by their actions as of late and in the past. Here we can do something proactive. Our town manager and council can make it happen to create a more positive perception by changing the behavior and creating an anti-racist culture that benefits all the residents and taxpayers in the community. One of the current goals under consideration by the town council is the continuation of anti-racist programming and training put forth by CSWG, specifically regarding the APD as a police force that like all police departments require at times the use of force, guns, and uniforms. Instead of recognizing the leadership and vision of the CSWG and your current town counselor, Alicia Walker, that put forth this measure as an opportunity to once again be at the forefront of the state and the U.S. in redefining policing and building reflective and more anti-racist racist department. There are counselors that are attempting to rewrite and change the motion already voted on by the council. This is going backwards. There are already measures taken by police departments in the US to enact plans for mandatory training for all police officers and staff about racism, anti-racism, black history, and its connection to policing. It is evident that all departments, including the council should participate in ongoing anti-racist training, which requires a prolonged commitment to equity. But why wouldn't we start with the most necessary department in this regard, the APD? Let's lead as we have done with CRESS and with DEI and begin changing the culture in the community by starting with the APD. Why wait until the worst case scenario happens whereby our youth may once again be stopped, harassed and held without cause. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Dee. Ronnie Parker, please go ahead. Hi, wow, well, after that, I'm not really sure what to say. Um, I did come to speak about um, the motion that was passed concerning training. And uh, in fact, I didn't even think about the fact that it was going to be first the police. From, from my part, if somebody called me today and said, come to anti-racism anti training, I would jump, I would change my schedule. I would do everything because I know that it's so central to so many aspects of all our lives. And there's so much we don't understand and so much we don't know. So I sort of feel like the police, I wanted to say, how come they get to go first? And then I find out that they don't want to go first. Um, I really think that uh, for the reasons cited, particularly the power that we vest in police officers, it's really important for them to do this. And uh, I believe equally that council members should do it. And some of this I heard in the discussion earlier, and it's not because I support one or the other for vice president, I don't really care because I think you're all amazing people, not just hard work wise, but delving into complex material and managing all our different voices um, in different ways, of course. Uh, but I really um, heard what Alicia said that you need change because our world is changing. And we, we see this in our national level and everywhere, even in, I work in the corporate world mostly, even there we see it, where old people don't leave. And as a result, the company suffers. And we all know this, the world is changing. You have to move on, have your time, move on. Um, and I think that respecting and following the change that's happening in the world. And now I'm speaking about the anti-racism stuff. 
that things are happening, things are changing. Let's educate ourselves. Let's be open to the changes that are happening and you know, respond in responsible ways. So um, I feel really troubled that a motion that was passed on this is trying to be rewritten. It seems to me entirely inappropriate uh, for our town council to do that. And I would strongly urge you to trust your judgment of the moment. It's not always right, but you made a judgment and move on. So we, we and you don't have to have really long meetings if we can move on with the things we've decided upon. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Ronnie. Brianna, please go ahead. Hi, everyone. I want to amplify how important it is that we keep with Ms. Walker's original language and her motion that was passed in the town manager's goals around the APD taking actionable steps to be anti-racist. I was a former member of the community safety working group, and I know from almost every meeting that I've sat on with you all that you are not required to stand by all of the CSWG's recommendations. And I also know that you all have very different lived experiences in this town than myself and others. With that said, I want you all to know how hard the CSWG worked on the second part of our charge and how hard we fought for an extension to dig deeper. The desire for the APD to have an anti-racist culture is not just the aftermath of of the July 5th incident. We asked you all to do this to keep our community safe over a year ago. We know that we knew as a group that the police department was not going anywhere. And that's why we recommended the APD work toward creating an anti-racist culture. Not just, not just trainings, but a culture because we wanted all members of our community to feel safe. It feels unsettling that officers may feel threatened or under attack when this comes up. It feels more unsettling that our chief of police can stand under a Black Lives Matter sign, but his team can be so resistant to making sure all community members feel safe by participating in actionable steps to create an anti-racist culture. It is not adding up to me. The police department needs to lead this initiative as it is one that interacts with this community more than any other department and at a more intimate level than others. I know that conversations about race, racism and different lived experiences can be tough for this group. But before I finish up, I wanted to share a quote for you all to think about. When someone is accustomed to privilege, equality starts to feel like oppression. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Brianna. We're going to try John Root again. John, can you hear us? Uh, now, can you hear me? We can, John. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, my name is John Root and I live at 23 Greenlees Drive in Amherst. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. I was the chairperson of the Town of Amherst Recycling and Refuse Management Committee when it submitted a comprehensive solid waste master plan in 2016, over six years ago. The plan was created with the assistance of Arlene Miller, the Western Massachusetts Municipal Assistance Coordinator at the time, and Susan Waite, the town's part-time recycling and solid waste coordinator. The st two strategies were prioritized in this plan, a pay-as-you-throw fee structure to incentivize waste reduction and curbside pickup of organic matter including food scraps, non-recyclable paper products, and other compostable materials. There was strong townwide support for both of these measures in a survey that our committee conducted at the time. We also urged that the town create a full-time waste management staff position to accomplish these waste reduction goals. This plan was received with enthusiasm by the select board. The bylaw proposed by Zero Waste Amherst advocating that the town take responsibility for waste management by hiring a hauler that will provide both pay as you throw and residential cut curbside organic pickup has also received considerable townwide support. There is a growing awareness of the many compelling reasons to limit unnecessary consumption and divert recyclable materials from the waste stream. We all know that wealthy com communities both consume and discard a disproportionate amount of our planet's non-renewable resources, creating downstream impacts that include deadly environmental pollution, as well as greenhouse gas emissions associated with production, transportation, and disposal of these materials. It is also well known that underprivileged populations suffer disproportionately from the health effects of pollution from both incinerators and landfills, as these facilities are consistently sited near low-income communities. Approximately 50% of, uh, of our residential solid waste is compostable. 
discarding this valuable resource with its attendant greenhouse gas and environmental pollution consequences is simply unacceptable. In other Massachusetts municipalities where a pay-as-you-throw fee structure has been introduced, a diversion rate of 30 to 40 percent of materials from the waste stream is immediately observed. These two strategies taken together have the potential to accomplish a more significant positive effect in re reducing our carbon footprint and environmental pollution impact than any other measures taken in Amherst history. I urge that the Town Council include the strongest possible language for including the adoption of the Zero Waste Amherst Waste Reduction Bylaw in the Town Manager's Goals for 2023, making possible the subsequent goal of implementation of the bylaw by January of 2024. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, John. Uh, that concludes public comment. We're going to move on to the consent agenda. Uh, the following items were selected because they were considered to be routine and would have no expected to pass with no controversy. Um, to remove an item, please let me know after I go through the full list, and that does not require a second. To move the following items in the printed motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. Waive, waiver of Town Council Rules of Procedure Rule 8.6 for agenda item 6A, 2023, Reverend Mark, Dr. Martin Luther King Proclamation, King Jr. Proclamation. Let me just note, this is just allowing us to approve it tonight is to not actually approve the um, proclamation because we still have to review that. Uh, the second, 8B, referral of zoning revisions duplex to Community Resources Committee Planning Board and GOL committee. Again, this is just a referral. It's not an approval of the bylaw. Uh, 8C, approval of order FY2320A, Hickory Ridge property. Um, 8D, adoption of order authorizing the acquisition of 457 Main Street property for sheltering affordable housing, supportive transitional housing and or support services. 8E, approval of Davis Conservation Restrictions, Flathills Road. 8H, referral of surplus real property disposition policy to the Finance Committee. And let me just note that that means any other items related to that issue. Uh, and then 9B1, appointment of ZBA uh, Zoning Board of Appeals associate members. There are three, they are listed on your agenda. 9B4, designation of representatives to speak on behalf of the town council at four meetings. That usually includes and includes here the president and the chair of the finance committee. 11A and to D is approval of the following town council meeting minutes, November 1, uh, special town council meeting with community safety and social justice committee, November 7th, special town council meeting, town manager evaluation reading period, November 7th, 2022, special town council meeting with budget coordinating group financial indicators, November 7th, 2022, regular meeting. Are there items? Just let me get to the point I can see hands. Are there items that people would like removed? Pam Bruni, you have your hand up. Can we remove 8.B, referral of duplexes? 8.D. B, I'm sorry, I'm flipping pages. Yes, duplex. Okay, are there any other requests? Please raise your hand if there are. Dorothy, Pam. Signals. Um, Briefly, um, 8C, approval of order Hickory Ridge property. Um, and just a question on 8H, referral of surplus real property disposition policy. Okay, so those items will be removed. And when we come back to them, you can ask your question and we'll vote separately on those items. So as you look at the motion in front of you that is on the screen, please remove 8B, 8C, and 8H. Is there a second? Second, Dublin Gothier. Dorothy, you have your hand up still. Okay. All right. Well, then we'll move to the vote. Shalini Ball-Milne. 
Yes. On uh, Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Felicia Walker. It's yes. unanimous, and those items have been removed. Uh, let's move on to the Dr. Martin Luther King proclamation, and we'll put that up on the screen. There were some different suggestions of changes, and Athena, I think you've re you've received those, correct? That's correct. So this shows all the changes. There were some changes that conflicted, which is why we can just post um, a revised version with everyone's changes and, and put it on consent. There were some changes here that don't agree. So we could just go so through. So where are the ones that agree? Obviously adding the community sponsors. The next one is the third paragraph down, and that is to, instead of saying Dr. King stated, Dr. King challenged the nation in his speech that. Um, the next one I'm, I'm just accepting are, are the there any was there, there any objection to those changes please raise your hand Dorothy your hand is up I back a paragraph two I submitted a change saying that the Civil Rights Act of 64 and 65 came before the it's reversing the time order of those two phases the, the Civil Rights Act came before the removal of Jim Crow laws done locally so you want it to read um i can submit um, i saw that dorothy that was unclear so i wasn't sure what you meant um okay well i okay i didn't personally research it my husband told me who was that the civil rights act came before the local laws in the south and that seemed rational to me so we was just reversing those two phrases those two clauses. Um, so the civil rights movement uh, led to the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and Voting Rights Acts of 1965 um, and other anti-discrimination laws and to the uh, help change public policy from segregation to integration resulting in the repeal of post-reconstruction era state laws uh, mandating racial segregation of South known as Jim Crow. Just, just reversing the order. Resulting in the repeal of post-segregation laws. Uh, Dorothy, can you see the screen up here? Yes. It, the, the editor didn't capture the way she would re reverse the world. Can you read how you would like it to read, Dorothy? So at the end of Jim Crow law should be a period. Okay. Are there any objections to this? I don't believe that we need an and there. There's an and at after every whereas. Mm -hmm.
Oh, I yes, got it. All right, the next paragraph, is there any change at this point? Moving on to the next paragraph, the one uh, which is, whereas Reverend Dr. King believed uh, the services, that service was the soul's highest purpose and with the path to happiness and greatness. And in there is a sentence that should now read, what are you doing for others which led communities? Okay, any problems there? Dorothy's hand is up, I'm not sure. Dorothy, that's... you have your hand up. Okay, then we have a submission. I believe, Michelle, this was yours. Um, and this is a submission to use this paragraph, but not the next, well, not all of the next paragraph. Are there any concerns or objections to the insertion of this paragraph? Whereas, Dr. Mart Whereas Martin Luther King Jr. visited and spoke in the dining room of First Church Amherst on April 17, 1961, in the furtherance of the freedom struggle of Black free people in the United States of America, commonly known as the Civil Rights Movement. We've added the word Reverend Doctor. Okay. Uh, the suggestion's been made to eliminate the next paragraph. Any other objections to eliminating the next paragraph? I'm sorry. So it's not the there, full. there's an additional yeah. separate whereas. There's another whereas. I'll treat that as a separate paragraph. Okay. Um, is and the next is whereas the movement to recognize Dr. King's legacy as a federal holiday began four days after his assassination, yet took 15 years of struggle before his birth was finally celebrated as a federal holiday. Is there any objections to that? Okay, then we're going to go on to the next one, and it's eliminating the words, but also by, and instead of saying, and actively, and also not only. I'm seeing no objections. We're moving on to the next now, therefore. Uh, any changes there? Yes, there are changes. Are there any objections? Michelle. I'm not sure if, oh, my audio is connected. Okay. Um, doesn't the first now, therefore, usually say now, therefore, be it resolved? Or if, if there's only one, does it just say now, therefore? And then usually it's now, therefore, be it resolved, and then be it further resolved? But it's not a resolution. It's a proclamation. It's not a resolution. Oh, it's I see. It's a proclamation. Okay. But so should it be now, therefore, Okay. we proclaim? I know, but does that need, I'm getting picky, sorry. I, Maybe just, we should I do want to point out that while this says January 16th, the day we're going to be reading this is January 15th, yeah. but 16th is the actual holiday. Usually we have something in that. Yeah, so it says the dedicated ceremony. Yeah, it, I, I, that date's there. Yeah, the dates are there. It's combined into one now, therefore. Got it. Is what yeah. those edits do. Just okay. like are there any objections to those changes? Michelle, you have your hand up? No, I don't. Okay. Then I would like to make the following motion. Then I just have a oh. quick question. Yes. Um, I hate to do wordsmith, but the, the council proclaim and then later it confirms and does it doesn't have an S. Do we need it? So it's we yeah. proclaim. We, the Emerson. I guess it's council we request. Proclaim. And affirm, we affirm, yeah. Do what I'm saying? It suddenly affirm has an S after it, and the next one has an S. I don't care which it is, but they seem like they should be the same. I think it should be affirm request. Yeah. Someone can figure. That's the only. Thing. I just yeah. wanted to to read intelligently, okay. so I I don't really care how it's fixed. I have a question too, and that's about the past tense of the verb stood. Wouldn't you stay stands? He Martin Luther King stands for these. You you can stand for things after you're dead. I'm fine with that change. If there's any other questions, stands. Okay. Any other questions or comments? I'm going to move to the motion. 
The motion is to adopt the 2023 Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Proclamation as amended at the January 9th, 2023 Town Council meeting. Is there a second? Second, Devlin Gothier. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, we're going to start with uh, Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmers, and I. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Nika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. At Jennifer Taub. Aye. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Balmill. Yes. It's unanimous. And like I mentioned earlier, I'll be polling to see who is able to join us um, at the uh, event on the 15th in this room. Um, we're going to continue on and then take a break. Um, under presentations and discussions, I just want to just briefly mention upon the election of a new president, vice president, or election of the president, and vice president each year, the council basically then moves to any reorganize, reorganizing it's going to do. This includes the council committee appointments. There are four councils, council committees. Um, each of you are serving on at least one of those now. And so it would be, it will be my intention tomorrow morning to send out an email and ask for as rapid turnaround as possible uh, to see if people want to ask for changes in their present assignments. Um, so that you'll be asked to give a first preference, a second preference, and so forth. Um, when I get those, I then try to look over what's possible, but um, also make those appointments as soon as possible. Then when the committee is meets after those appointments are public, which will be no later than the 23rd of January, uh, the committee then goes through the process of electing its chair and vice chair. Are there any questions about that process? Michelle. Um, when we respond to the survey tomorrow, does that include if we want to if we're on two committees, for example, pair back to one or um, are we, okay. Exactly. And, you know, I look for, I look forward to individual conversations with people if I don't understand what they're asking for and uh, so forth, okay. Um, then on the non-voting liaisons, uh, if you'll quickly, Athena, put the list up on the screen. We presently have eight committees to which we have non-voting liaisons. Um, it is the responsibility of the council at this point to voice any opinions with regard to whether there's committees we should keep or not keep or add. And then this goes to GOL and they come back to us with a recommendation by the 23rd as to what the definitive list should be for committees to which we have liaisons. Uh, Athena? Sorry, one second. Pat has her hand up then. I'm sorry, Pat? Yeah, a quick question, and I apologize, I should know this. Does the Recreation Department have a current liaison, or has it been assigned that position? Is there a recreation? There is a recreation committee. Yes. Does it have one now? Not from the council. Okay, thank okay. you. Would you like that to be considered? Yes. Okay, Dorothy, you have your hand up. Um, yes, it is. It's right up there. I'm sorry, I just can't hear Dorothy. I think she's not pressing the button on her mic. Dorothy, it's on the list. If you look Dorothy, at your, the list is now at your on screen. the screen. Okay, and it is listed. Right now, there are two people that are liaisons right. to that. I Thank think you. one of the questions should be whether or not there continues to needs to be two. Okay. Are there other questions or comments that you would like to forward to GOL? The only comment I heard was consideration of adding the recreation committee. Okay. 
then we take no action on this at this time. Uh, let me just go on to 9B, which is B, which finishes the organization of the council for the moment. We've already done the Zoning Board of Appeals. We appointed them in the consent agenda. The budget coordinating group consists of three councilors. It meets with members of the school committee and it meets with members of the um, library. Right for the past year, if I am correct, um, Mandy, Joe, Andy, and I have served on that committee. Uh, you have your hand up, Dorothy. Yes. Yes, Please. I do. Uh, I went to look on the count, the official website, to see who was there. And the uh, there was no listing of people, so I read the latest minutes, and they were 2016. So I would suggest that that just be attended to. We just caught up on those minutes uh, over the weekend, actually. Paul Paul drafted them, and Allison McDonald and I were assigned to approve them. But as of today, they're still not there. Not but there. they were just, but they might not have been posted by today. But thank you. Um, there haven't been that many meetings of the BCG because we've been using the uh, financial indicators meeting as the BCG meeting for since 2019. Uh, once we, um, I think last year we had one meeting. In this past year, in 2022, we had two meetings. We, Allison and I approved a set of minutes for those meetings just over the weekend. Okay. And just the year the bottom fell out of everything we had a spring meeting because we'd done the budget in the fall and we had to redo the budget so right. i mean it is it's a scarce but it was because of that it was a, a reconvene yeah paul if we're going to have to go back i will have to go back and look in my notes and see if i can come up with anything for that meeting okay that would be in 2020 Yes. Spring of 2020. Okay, we will look for those. Dorothy, thank you for drawing attention to that issue. It's important that committee meetings have minutes. Um, the question before the council is, are there people interested in these committees at this time? And we basically, this is a council decision. So um, I'd like to ask for people to raise their hand if they are interested in BCG. Do you want to do them one at a time? I want to know everybody who's interested. I'm, I'm actually going to raise my hand because it's a part of this. This is the budget coordinating group only. Okay, I have my hand up. Mandy Joe has her hand up. Andy Steinberg has his hand up. Are there any other people who are interested in the budget coordinating group? If I were back on the finance committee, I would be. Okay, um, that's this particular one doesn't have a requirement for finance committee. Uh, Andy and I happen to be on the finance committee. Mandy Joe is not at this point. Okay, all right. So are there any other people that would like to be considered? Um, then if not, I have to find the motion. Uh, to appoint councillors um, Griesmer, Haneke, and Steinberg to the budget coordinating group effective immediately for a term to expire January 2nd, 2024. Is there any... Shane there seconds. seconds. Shane seconds. Is there any other question? All right, then I'll go to the roll call. Anna Devon Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Jo Haneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Aye. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Balmilne. Yes. Patty, uh, Patty Angelus. Aye. Excellent. Uh, we're moving on then to the other committee uh, and that committee is the Joint Capital Planning Committee. And the only reason I feel strongly that we need to move this is that Sean is trying to 
um, get these meetings scheduled. The people who have served on this in the last year are Anna, Mandy Jo, and Kathy. And Kathy, you've been the chair for one or two years? Three years, Mish. Okay. Um, and uh, let me just mention that the only restriction on this committee is that no more than two people can serve on it from the finance committee. So whatever motion we make tonight will be subject to the uh, appointment of the finance committee. I lowered my hand. I'm not interested. Thank you. So uh, which who would like to serve on the JCPC committee? Please raise your hand. I'm seeing Kathy Shane, I'm seeing Pam Rooney, I'm seeing Anna Devlin Gothier, and I'm seeing Mandy Jo Haneke. Okay. Uh, how do you want to proceed with this, Athena? Um, we can have discussion, and then if there's not a consensus about the, the counselors, then we can vote them one at a time. Okay. Uh, might be useful for one of the existing members, Kathy, since you've been chair, talk a little bit about the meetings, when they are or when they tend to be, and what the focus is of those meetings. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, so the composition is there are three counselors, and there's two from library and two from school. Mm -hmm. And actually, last year, both of the people from school were new. So this committee for a while had a lot of people that knew everything that was going on, but that was not the case. We start meeting in February and Sean gives us a schedule, but we meet literally every week, once a week. It has been at around 6.30 at night and Thursdays, but the first thing that's gonna happen is a poll once we find out who's on it to see whether that timing works. And during that time, um, each of those sessions, we start out with a general overview of what this is and what's in the queue. And we now also have this inventory that's been building so we can see um, how much money we have to spend the inventory. But Sean sets up times for the departments to come in so that we get the capital requests from major departments a time to discuss each. And that's what the set of meetings are. Then the committee by... Um, I think we've made it every year by the middle of March, we have a report that comes back after we deliberate and that goes to the town manager. So this is an advisory committee. Um, in recent years, uh, because earlier JCPC said, please help us with this. In recent years, what we initially get is a nearly balanced set of proposals with a queue. So it says, this is what we were able to fit into this year's capital proposals. However, here's what's waiting that we can't fund. Um, and so we can do variations on it. When I first watched JCPC, there was about twice as much being asked for as the committee had, and not until Paul came in and helped group the group decide how to cut it back down did we get to it. But, but we're looking at five years was the other thing I should say, that we're as we're looking at the one year, we're looking at five years, and then what can't be fit in those five years is a what else was there. So it's it's a pretty involved set of um, discussions about what's the now, what's coming, and where's the money coming from. And what it does not include is the four major capital projects or big, big capital projects like that. That's right. And what it, the other thing it, it doesn't include, but it is enabled to um, stimulate. And we heard a couple of comments like this tonight. We set up a, um, a uh, climate change set of money that is not designated for specifics. And we first was one pool, then we doubled it last year. And that money has been used to be matching grant money to go out and get other money or studies. So it's a place that rather than a specific idea can also uh, bring in other money because we put, put aside some money in the capital budget. Mandy Joe, you had your hand up in addition to your hand up. So go ahead, please. I, I might be able to cut this short, yep. this debate short. I am happy to un well to withdraw my interest to allow Pam to go on since I have served on JCPC for all four years. This council's existed. I'm happy to go off to all expand right. that pool. 
Okay, Andy. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that this is a unusual committee in that it exists because the charter mandates that it exists and it's uh, charter section 5.7B that establishes and gives direction to what the committee's response composition and responsibilities are. So at this point, we have three candidates. I'm gonna make a motion to appoint, appoint counselors, uh, Devlin Gothier, um, Pam Rooney, I'm sorry, Rooney, and uh, Shane to the but to the to the Joint Capital Planning Committee effective immediately for a term to expire January 2nd, 2024. Is there a second? Second. Second. Okay. I'm gonna go to the roll call. Any further questions or comments? All right. Uh, I start with Griesmer and that's an I. Maybe I should have started with Devlin Goth here. Lynn, there are there are hands up. I'm sorry. It was still Pam or I think oh, we're both just you. really thank interested. You. I took them as <laughs> interest hands, but not, thank you. Um, Anna Devlin Goth here. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Aye. Pam Rooney. Aye. I'm, I'm sorry, Dorothy <laughs> Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Aye. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shelley Belmilne. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Excellent. Unanimous. We're done with that piece of the agenda. We are going to now take a 10 minute break. Okay. Please un please mute. Okay. And also take your picture down, but put your picture back up when you come back. Thank you.
Okay, let's get back, please. <laughs> Moving on. My timekeepers are watching. <laughs> But I just want to note that we finished within 10 minutes of my projected time for that first set of things. Lynn, don't do that. <laughs> you just blew it. <laughs> You're right. But Pat, my you'll keep me on track. Never forgive you. <laughs> All right. Please turn your video back on. I think I better do that too. Please turn your video back on to let me know you're back. Um, we have three items that were pulled off of consent. The first is um, the zoning revisions regarding duplex. My understanding is that Pat is going to make a brief summary statement. Mandy Jo will answer questions. There's going to be a brief council discussion. At that time, you should stick to the following comments. What are the types of you of things do you as a counselor want to make sure that CRC looks at? Don't get into the debate, just what do you wanna make sure they look at, okay? And then we will move to a vote. So with that, Pat, are you ready? Yes, I am. Great. Um, zoning policies and practices in Amherst and across the nation have historically uh, restricted housing production and excluded people by building durable walls between racial and socioeconomic groups. Single family zoning has impacted our environment. And the very changes we are proposing have the potential to make the town more affordable by expanding the supply of housing, make the town fairer by reducing racial and economic se segregation, and combat Cl sorry, combat climate change by reducing commutes and making housing more environmentally friendly. We're simply asking uh, to have the chance to create the broadest possible spectrum of housing for our community and one that minimizes the impact on the environment. We would like these uh, revisions uh, to be forwarded to the Planning Board and the Community Resources Committee for public hearings, review, and recommendation no later than April 1st, 2023. Thank you. Okay, Mandy Joe, comment? Pat covered it. Okay, are there questions at this time? Dorothy. I have a number of questions. Um, where is the ownership opportunity? Um, also, it's not clear to me what the non-fraternity residential areas are. Um, is why is it the desire to increase the load of the planning board and to take things away from the zoning board of appeals? Um, uh, what is the intent of that? Um, I see um, this would promote more non-owner occupied rental housing in residential neighborhoods. And given the cost of housing, um, it is extremely expensive to build. So if you have a owner occupied and a duplex, um, that is the rent that that would have to be charged to cover the cost of this is just a simple, simple one person adding a, a, an apartment, that rent is gonna be very high. So we've seen what the rents, uh, we have some new townhouses that are coming up in um, my neighborhood and we have seen what the rents are and um, they're very high. They're beyond what a family can pay. And so we, I understand the intent and it's a worthy intent, but I'm just not sure that with the present economics that would work. Um, there's also a concern with this by taking it away from the Zoning Board of Appeals, um, then create less public input um, and kind of you know how that would work out. Um, so those are some of the um, questions, but um, mainly a lot of them have to do with the actual practicality of how you can get uh, rents that people could afford and certainly how they, where the home ownership opportunities are um, given the present state of our building situation. Thank you. Uh, Pam? Yeah, I, I look forward to the CRC being able to delve into this and especially to hear from the planning board. Um, the changes that are being proposed to our permitting process, it looks like it's primarily a change to the permitting process rather than some of the details and the setbacks and all of that that accompany 
um, for any residential development. Um, I think, um, what was I gonna say? <clears throat> I'm I'm sort of looking at the master plan as a reference, and and the master plan does state that um, that we should have design guidelines before increasing density, and this has come up a couple times both in the in the town center and in general development. Um, we do not have design guidelines before increasing density, which this you know clearly is trying to accomplish. Uh, Northampton, on the other hand, has a marvelous set of design guidelines specifically for duplexes. And um, I think before we delve in and lift all of the, essentially lift all of the restrictions for permitting, um, we really need to kind of think about where we want to head with the end result that, that may occur. So again, I look forward to looking at it in detail. Okay, uh, Jennifer? Uh, <clears throat> yes, I'll, I'll be echoing a little of what uh, Dorothy said. Um, both Dorothy and I live in a uh, you know general residence district, so we already have you know duplexes, triplexes, and townhouses um, are already you know uh, part you know of the zoning allows that. So that's you know not a change for um, you know certain districts in town. Um, I would just question. I guess we will discuss this in the committees, but um, I I'm not aware of too many times, if ever, that special, like permits are not granted. So like a townhouse, we have several that are already in our district and another one that's about to be built. Um, and having it go through the special permitting process was extremely helpful in, um, it wasn't onerous to the developers that were proposing it. It just seems that that's something that, you know, just, um, ensures that there'll be another look and that there's more opportunity for community input. And I, you know, um, don't see what the harm is in continuing to have special permits, why we would want to reduce that to a site plan review. And then I did have a concern because I'm always talking about, I, you know, more than anything, I would like to see more housing, both rental and home ownership opportunities that um, are, you know, accessible to, you know, to, young families, retirees, you know, all, many, you know, households in Amherst um, at different price points. And I'm just not, I think we're going to have to really delve into, I don't see how this um, proposal is going to lead to more um, duplexes, triplexes, and particularly rental um, townhouses that are going to be more affordable. And when Dorothy referenced a townhouse development that was permitted um, in, uh, our district um, last year, and the neighbors, the neighborhood was very excited for this townhouse development. We thought it would be a great opportunity to bring in, you know, um, young faculty, uh, young administrators at UMass, uh, young families, you know, um, and we were we were hoping that it would um, be home, and we're still hoping to non-student households because otherwise it will be with sixty-eight bedrooms total, a um, off-campus dormitory. But we were concerned because, so in a letter that the uh, developer's representative sent to our planning department last year, because the ZBA had asked what the rents would be, and they said it's a market rate project and the rents charge will be market rate. And currently that means studios, the range will be $1,500 to $2,050, one bedrooms will be $1,600 to $2,100. Two bedrooms will be $2,200 to $3,020. Three bedrooms will be $3,000 to $3,900. And four bedroom units will be $3,700 to $4,500. So I think you know we may want to look at pairing this with something like a minimal distance requirement. But I think if we just you know um, make it, this seems to be you know making the permitting process. Um, easier for duplexes, triplexes, and townhouses, we may find a lot of units that um, aren't really priced um, for the, you know, population we're hoping to serve. Thank you. Okay. Kathy? Um, I wrote up my comments and questions, so I will send them forward. And so I just, um, 
to to add to some of what's being said is um, a question about triplexes. We are putting a new concept in there. Um, we have a specific owner occupied duplex. Should we have an owner occupied triplex category is, is a question and my answer would be yes. Um, townhouses I think are quite different um, than duplex and triplex. And when you get up to the RO, the rural areas, I think we need to think about them differently. They're not allowed at all right now. Um, and the definition of them is uh, they should be on heavily trafficked streets, close to business, commercial areas where they already have multifamily use. So one question I had is if the expansion may be too broad. And if you bring it into areas that never had them before, do you want to restrict them to one building? Because they can have up to 10, but they could have up to 10 units, but they could have two buildings. Now, otherwise, you're really allowing apartments in. So I think townhouses are a, a different kind of creature when you get to some of these areas. Um, so I will, I will send these in. Um, and the final one is, how does some of this interact with ADUs? We've got a lot of flexibility because of we, what we've already put into the law. So you know, people can have two units on their property. It could be attached to their house. So when does it move from being a non-occupied owner occupied duplex to a house with two units in it you know so just trying to think about how, you know and what is a triplex if my home which already can have two if i could get three units in it do i have a triplex or do i just have a house with three dwelling units in it so it's kind of trying to think of what these are cuz in the past in a lot of places the difference was an owner owned the duplex, half of it, and someone else owned the other half. They, they, and so did triplex. You know, it was it allowed people to come into ownership for part of a building, so they weren't just rental units. So just trying to think about how these all interact. Okay, um, Kathy and the other three counselors that have spoken, as well as any other counselors, let's make sure you send your questions to CRC. And they will be compiled and dealt with there. With that, I'm going to make a motion. The motion is to refer the proposed revisions of zoning bylaw section 3.32, residential uses, standards, and conditions for two family detached dwellings, townhouse, and subdividable converted dwellings, zoning bylaw tw article 12, definitions, and zoning bylaws section. 4.420, 4.4211, 43, whatever, and 9.2. To the Planning Board and the Community Resources Committee for public hearings to be held no later than April 1, 2023, and for a written recommendation from the Planning Board to the Town Council and CRC no later than 21 days after the Planning Board hearing, and for the Community Resources, Communi Resources Committee to send a written recommendation to the Town Council and to submit all materials to the GOL Committee for a review of clarity, consistency, and actionability within 60 days of the hearing held by CRC. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Uh, further comment, Dorothy? Yes, um, the, the question is about the timing. Um, someone that I showed this to said, oh, that's very fast, that's very speedy, that's faster than usual. Um, I really can't tell if that's true, but I am interested in knowing, as it seems to be on a very fast timetable, and I'm wondering why. Uh, Mandy Jo, you wanna to speak to that since you're the one that has de developed the diagram. Um, so state law requires that any hearing on zoning articles in both the planning board and CRC begin within 65 days of the referral. So that's why that date is in there. It does not require them end within 65 days of referral. And I believe I would not be speaking um, outside of Pat. I think she would agree with this. We do not expect the hearings to be done in one night. <laughs> so, so we don't expect it to be back in, answer. in that one. And Dorothy, thanks for that question and Mandy Joe for the answer because I think it helps clarify it for the public. I looked at this and I said, there is no way it's happening in 60 days. Okay. Uh, any other questions or comments? Moving that, we're moving to a vote. This is a referral only. Uh, Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Joe Haneke? Aye. Anika Lopes? Aye. Michelle Miller? Aye. Dorothy Pam? Yes. 
Pam Rooney. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Aye. Leisha Walker. Yes. Uh, Shanley Balmilne. Yes. Patty Angelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. The referrals unanimous. Uh, the next item on the agenda was uh, removed from consent. Um, so it's the transfer of portion of Hickory Ridge property on West Pomeroy Lane to the Recreation Commission and appropriation and transfer acceptance of the park grant. And I believe that Dorothy, you asked that you wanted to clarify something, please ask. Um, a um, member of the town, a constituent, um, raised a, a point on this. I just wanted to have it coupled with this in the minutes that um, there be a consideration of using some of that land as a youth center connected with outdoor youth activity spaces. And I thought, well, that's interesting. So I thought that that was a, a good thing to bring up here just to be attached and considered when the time comes. Okay. Just to be clear, that's not the same land in this case. Is This is recreation only. The youth center would be a physical facility and that's on a different part of the land. Well, okay, so there's the, the, an outdoor recreation space for youth could be, you're saying, yes. there cannot be any structures, is that what you're saying, in this part of the land? For this part, it's outdoor only, but David, you've joined us, and please answer for me. Yeah. Sure, I think the, I think the answer is yes. We're, we're going to try to do a lot of things out at Hickory Ridge, and um, the planning, planning department is a, a little stretched right now with a couple of vacancies, but we are working... Uh, diligently on a, a comprehensive plan for Hickory Ridge, which will include, you know, um, if all goes well tonight, the accessible trail that uh, was funded by the state, 70% uh, uh, funded by the state, um, and, and consideration of what to do with the rest of the property. So we're looking at trails, connections to East Hadley Road and the neighborhoods to the north. We're looking at connections to uh, the village center, and we're also looking at um, repurposing some of the frontage along West Pomeroy Lane. Um, so I think outdoor recreation, passive recreation, um, we've talked about an amphitheater, um, uh, community gardens, we're, we're looking at all of those, all of the uh, suggestions that came in through, uh, through the website um, and, and other, other means, the public meetings we had. So uh, as I said last time, we're also seriously looking at whether that site could support um, a uh, South Fire Station. So I think all of, all of the above are still in the works. Nothing has been excluded. Uh, we will, of course, uh, take great care. The land is ecologically very sensitive. There's a lot of floodplain there, rare species habitat. That is, uh, those are layers of consideration that, by law, we have to um, we have to uh, put front and center. So we'll do that. Thank you, David. Any other questions? No, thank you very much. Sure. So uh, the motion is as follows to adopt town council order FY 2320-20A, Hickory Ridge property recommended by the finance committee on January 9, 2023 and shown on page 15 to 16 of the January 9 motion sheet as presented. Um, is there a second? Second. Devlin got there. Sorry. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Lynn, actually, can, can you, um, it should be 15 to 17. Pages, pages 15. Oh, it's 15 to 17. To 17. Thank, Thank you. you. I still okay. second it. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to start with Mandy Johanneke. Hi. Uh, Nika Lopes. Hi. Michelle Miller. Hi. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Aye. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Balmilne. Yes. Uh, Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. It's unanimous. David, again, I want to congratulate you and your staff on getting all of these wonderful grants and moving this kind of effort forward. Um, it's been a really big year for grant getting in Amherst. So thanks again, David. You are most welcome. And um, yeah, we've got a lot of work ahead of us. Paul and I were just talking about that. 23, 24, we've got to, we've got to uh, get going on new sidewalks and North Common and, and intersections and uh, ADA trails and the list goes on and on. So thank you. Um, we'll, we'll keep moving forward. 
thanks for all your work and to the, to the staff as well. Thank you. Thank you. I will convey that. Um, good. So the other item that was pulled off the uh, consent agenda was the surplus real property disposition policy. Let me preface talking to uh, asking Councillor Pam uh, about this. And just let me mention, this was referred to in the financial guidelines. And the idea is that it would be referred to the finance committee. The finance committee will make a recommendation back to the council and the council will then make a recommendation to the town manager regarding this policy. And that's just the beginning then of being of going back and starting to look at our excess property. My, my question was a very simple one. Why now? And what have you been doing up to now? We haven't been disposing of property now, and it did get included in the final financial guidelines for the first time this year. So that's why now. Okay. Thank you very much. Got it. Uh, with that in mind, then the... Um, Motion on this is to find the motion uh, to adopt the no page eight. Thank you. Um, oh, that's right. It got put here. I'm mm -hmm. I'm the one that moved it. Uh, to refer surplus real property disposition policy to the finance committee for review and recommendation to make it appropriate to our current government and ensure that it will inform actions with a report to the town council by April 3rd, 2023. Is there a second? Second, Haneke. Thank you. Uh, let me just mention there are other documents that this committee will look at and April 3rd is the point at which they need to at least give us an update, not necessarily a final recommendation. Any other questions on this? Okay, seeing none, we're going to move to Anika Lopes. Aye. Uh, Michelle Miller. Aye. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Aye. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shalini Balmilne. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devon Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Is aye. Thank you. Unanimous. Um, with agreement to the, by the committee, I'd like to move to the response to the open meeting law complaint and then come back to the count, town manager's goals, okay? The open meeting law complaint, item G in your packet, was filed by Allegra Clark on Tuesday, December 20th, 2022 and received on December 21st by the town clerk. T tonight's council packet includes the complaint, a memo from the town attorney regarding the complaint and attachments to that memo. The decision before the town council tonight is based upon the documents in the packet. The town attorney's memo clearly advises the council that there were no violations of open meeting law. This is what we are required by law to respond to, and we are, have to respond within 14 days. Therefore, I am placing the following motion on the table and seek a second. To authorize KP law to respond to the open meeting law complaint filed by Allegra Clark dated December 20th, 22 on behalf of the town council, consistent with the council's discussion on January 9th, 2023. Is there a second? Second, DeAngelis. Okay. So the floor is now open for discussion. I just want to again say the discussion is about whether or not we violated open meeting law. It's not about the meeting itself. Okay. Questions, comments? Michelle Miller. I'm trying to pull up the memo. I had uh, asked uh, Town Manager Bockelman to send some what I perceive as inaccuracies in the memo from uh, Lauren, and I'm just wondering if that, uh, Paul, if, if you had a chance to speak with Lauren about those. 
<clears throat> I have not gotten a response back to including them. So if you would, that, that if it's um, something that you would like to include in this, you can, if you want to change what the facts of what she worked on, you can say that and put those things right in. now. Okay, yeah. perfect. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so in the memo, um, I'm just, if you could uh, maybe go to someone else just for a second, Lynn, I'm going to sure. pull up my comments. Thank you. Alicia. Thank you. I just had a quick um, clarifying question um, in terms of process, um, just because Lynn, you said um, before we make the decision tonight. And so what decision are we making? Like, is it just the vote to ask KP law to respond? Or is there some other decision we think we will be making in regards to this? It's to ask KP law to respond based on the memo as they've laid it out and our discussion tonight. That's all. When you have an open meeting violation, it's a it's a legal and a state level process, and you must respond to the state uh, based on the filing. And that response is required within 14 days. We're at day 12 because of when this arrived and our meeting schedule. So um, that's all it is, is to decide, are we ready to have them file? Does that help, Alicia, or does it? Matter? That is helpful. Um, I'm just wondering, and then how, because it's just a little bit confusing because it says that they will respond in accordance with our decision. And so I would like also some clarity on what exactly that means, because there was no, like we didn't have a discussion before a motion was put on the table. And so that's also slightly confusing part of the process mm. here. So again, just more process questions um, in terms of how we, Right. So the the motion, which um, is to authorize them to respond to the open meeting law complaint filed by Electric Clark on behalf of the town council, consistent with our discussion tonight. So if there are some changes that people feel need to be made to the memo or some other comments, then now's the time to make them. And then the uh, discussion will be shared with KP Law and they will write the response to the memo. I mean, to the complaint. Does that help? Yes. So, uh, yes, that is helpful. Thank you, Lynn. And then my last question was just that. So, then we nor KP Law makes the decision as to whether or not it was actually a violation, uh, there was actually a violation or. Um, or that happens somewhere else. Hey, it, um, I'm going to look at Athena and Paul because I know both of them have been entrenched in this. So the council can decide as a group that it violated the open meeting law or it did not violate the open meeting law and KP law's response would reflect that decision. If the council agrees with the KP law memo that they did not violate the open meeting law, then KP law's response would basically include what was in the memo in the packet tonight. If the council determines that it did violate the open meeting law, then there would need to be some sort of statement or evidence or something that that did occur. And the council could, um, along with the response, take some action like the things that were suggested in the memo, creating mim minutes, having a discussion in a public meeting, and so forth. Paul? Yeah, just to focus your attention, if you want to go to the last page of the KP law memo, um, the last two paragraphs, it says, uh, the first was, if you said, if you think there was not a violation, here's what you do. If you think that there was a violation, here's what you do. And whichever the council comes up with on, on that, one of those two things, either there was a violation or there wasn't, KP law will respond based on that. So, and I think the one, if you think there was a violation, there's there's some remedial action that you would recommend that the council would take. Alicia, does that answer your questions? Thank you, yes, I'll, I will have more comments later. Thank you, Lynn, and thank you, Paul. Okay, uh, Michelle, I'm back to you. Oh. Um, so under relevant facts in the memo, um, toward the end of that paragraph, it says, 
Um, the council president, basically the police chief offered three dates and times when individual counselors were welcome to meet with the police officers. Um, and the council president sent several emails notifying counselors of this opportunity. I think it's important to correct this to indicate that the council president um, offered two opportunities. Um, the first meeting that occurred occurred without the knowledge of most of the council. Um, and I learned that by being in the meeting and hearing about the meeting that had occurred earlier in the week um, and asking Lynn, and she said, uh, I think referred to it as a trial run. Um, so that quote unquote trial run that occurred earlier in the week was not a meeting date that was offered to the full council. And it's not clear um, how the counselors who attended that meeting were invited to attend that meeting. I'm not questioning whether the meeting itself was a problem. It's just that's more accurate to say. Um, the other piece is somewhere uh, here. It says that, um, okay, uh, the council president reported that these listening sessions had occurred in her regular written report to the council um, in December. And uh, nobody in the public by looking at that report would know that the meetings occurred between the APD and counselors because they were reported under Lynn's meeting with staff. And so I believe the memo should reflect um, that the December report of the council president did not indicate that the meetings had occurred with counselors. Um, so I'm asking, I, I believe those are two significant inaccuracies and I don't know, you know, how, how or why, but I'd like for those to be Okay. Corrected. Okay. I do have other comments too, but I can, if there are other, I can come, you can come back to me. Okay. Kathy. I was going to go to the general question that was posed. Do we think there was an open meeting law violation? So do you want to move away from the specific wording of the, the memo? If anyone else wants to talk to that first, I'll. Wait. Okay. Is there anyone else that would like to speak to the the wording in the memo? I'm looking at people that already have their hands up. Andy or Mandy Jo, or the, if you're shaking your heads, no. Andy? No. Okay. So, Michelle, did you have anything else in the memo itself? No. Okay. Alicia, do you have anything else in the memo itself? Um, not exactly. I just wanted to share um, or actually ask in regards to what Michelle said, because we said we could make these edits. So how does that happen? Like now that Michelle said that, is that just automatically an edit or does that request get sent to KP law? That request will go along with the tape of this meeting and the minutes to KP law. Okay, thank you. So they, they will then adjust those sentences accordingly. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right. Anything else, Michelle? No? Okay, Kathy, we're going to the general comments. Um, as my understanding of what we can and can't not do, um, and then also this memo is that uh, we, we can be at an event, um, and in this case, at least the one I was at, there weren't seven of us, so it didn't get to that quorum member. But we can be an event if we're not talking about council policy, if we're basically there to listen and get information. And during the time I was there, that's all that happened. And in fact, uh, the councillors were remarkably quiet during most of it, and the people talked to us about um, their view of working in Amherst, uh, their view of recent events, but also their larger view of um, where, questioning where we were going, but there was very little interaction. You know, it was more them talking. Um, and I left early. Um, I didn't leave early. I didn't stay for the meet and greet because I didn't know we were gonna do that. But um, I, as I was walking out, 
one of the younger staff police people started to tell me his life story. He just wanted to know, let me know where he'd come from. He'd come from a low income uh, Puerto Rican background and and what it meant to him to have this job. It was just, a, I had never met him before. So it was a real opportunity that I've only met the people who I either see on parole or come to the finance committee. So I actually wish there were, would often be more opportunities like that, maybe even once a year. Um, so, so I'll stop there, but I'll, I'll say the same thing. I did a tour of DPW, which I'd never done. And I got to meet everyone who worked at DPW by walking around the building, got a much better idea of who was working there and what they were doing. Of course, I didn't meet anyone out on the road. And then later the same day, went to the fire station and they were all sitting around a room eating their lunch during a break and got to talk with them. So I just thought for me, I've never had those opportunities before and I really welcome them. I do ask that we stick to the issue of whether or not there was a violation of open meeting law. And so I just want to say that we we didn't talk about policy. We didn't talk about anything. We really were listening. Okay. Andy. In the same vein, I do not believe that there was a violation. And I turn at first to um, KP Law Memo, top of page four, where there are five understandings of the facts that are laid out there. And I think that all of them are well stated and consistent with my understanding. But the other thing that I want to point out in general, and I think it is covered in the memo, but I just want to refocus to it is that uh, the purpose of the open meeting law is to make sure that all discussions of matters that are going to be deliberated amongst the council take place in an open meeting. And um, so therefore you get to the question whether anything that was uh, discussed, which really wasn't a discussion, it was a listening session, was matters about which uh, the council deliberates and I saw nothing, heard nothing, knew of nothing that came forward in the meeting that I attended um, about what uh, was a matter that was going to come before the council because uh, the uh, supervision of the uh, staff in all of our departments um, is a matter of the executive branch, not the legislative branch. And uh, for that reason, I um, firmly believe that um, there was no violation. Mandy Jo. Thank you. Um, to me, the motion, well, I, I will say, I agree with what Andy and Kathy said. To me, there was no violation of open meeting law. Um, and therefore I look at this motion and I wonder if it can be made clearer. I'm not, I, and I'm hesitant at this point to make a motion to amend because I don't know where the council stands, but um, after more people have talked, I wonder if we added the phrase at the end of that motion um, that says that the town council did not violate open meeting law would make what we're actually voting on a whole lot clearer. Um, because then the motion would read to authorize KP law to respond to the open meeting law complaint on behalf of the council, consistent with the council's discussion on the 9th that the town council did not violate open meeting law. So I feel like that would be, if, if that's the direction the council, a majority of the council believes we should respond, I think that would be a clearer motion and give clearer direction to KP law. Um, I don't know whether it needs to be a motion to amend. I'm not sure right now is the right point to make that, um, but it might just be able to be a um, a friendly amendment after fuller discussion. Okay, let's go on. Um, Michelle, I'm, I'm gonna skip to Dorothy and Alicia next. Dorothy? Yes, well, I went through the meetings that were provided and what we come up with was there was no meeting, there was no deliberation, there was no quorum, therefore there was no violation of open meeting law. And I think that that is 
correct as the definition of open violation of open meeting law is concerned. Um, and yet we as counselors have been told if you talk among something with one or two persons then they might talk with somebody else. And we've been told we can, that to beware of serial communication, which I'll tell you has really limited my talking with many people in the council, my, my fellow council members, because I can't figure out where that begins and ends, okay? So that's just an introduction. So what I'm gonna say is that's, if we, we agree, according to the rules, there was no violation of open meeting law, yet something did occur, okay? And something occurred which made some people very unhappy because you're, when, when there, we had a council meeting where we were voting on something, one of our counselors started quoting things that um, she had been told at that meeting and using them as reasons why she could not vote for the certain language in a resolution. Now, of course, we go and talk to constituents, we get information all the time, and that was perhaps just information gathering. But what happened in that room, and I wasn't there, but I'm just, you know, from the reports that I've read, was that people met as people. Uh, there was an attempt to cross barriers, to get to understand who the people were, what their needs were, how they felt about things, and that's good. But you know that wasn't done with the residents who were very unhappy about July 5th. Now, there's a lot about that that we don't know. We don't get told various things. I don't know what attempts were made to meet with them. But I'm telling you that I will not feel satisfied with having said, no, there was no violation of the open meeting law, case closed because I feel that something is still left hanging in the air, all right? And I'm perfectly willing and, and to go talk with the police officers at a time of their convenience, but I would like to come with a few of the people who were upset and concerned about the July 5th meeting, not for a confrontation, but for a person-to-person -person human interaction. Because I, I mean, we've had this thing drag on because we tried to use rules. And, and sometimes we can't just use rules. We have to use our feelings and our hearts. And it sounded to me like the police officers were communicating on a feeling level at, that, at those meetings. So I'm just saying, I would like to have the next step taken so that we can, I am for healing. I'm not to go, I'm not so sure I wanna to go to yet another meeting that says it's about healing. I want to do some real healing and to get some people together to talk so that they will understand each other as human beings and where they come from. And like Kathy said, he wanted me to know who he was. Okay. Well, that's what we all want. We all want. And I think that in Amherst, we should be able to pull this off. That's just my feeling. Alicia. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I want to echo a lot of the same uh, sentiments as Dorothy. One, because I was not at any of the meetings, and so I don't feel like I could personally state whether or not there was um, an open meeting law violation. Um, and so that piece of me that has no idea as to the reality of what happened would like to see the uh, public records request before making this decision, because I don't think it is abundantly clear what actually happened. Um, and I think that's part of my discomfort with the situation. Um, and then just a couple of things that I wanted to point out. Um, one in the KP law uh, memo, it does state the, the five points that Andy was referencing that the open meeting law does not prohibit mem members of the council from visiting a department, doing a site walk at a department, or listening informally to members of a department. Um, and I'm not so sure that that constitutes an informal listening. If it was a planned, it seemed pretty formal to me um, because there were refreshments and there was mingling and it was formally set up ahead of time. Um, and I would also just like to speak a little bit more to the sentiment that Dorothy was speaking to is, I think the reason why this situation doesn't feel good is because we weren't transparent and honest with the community. Um, and so I think one of our goals as a council, one of the reasons why I ran for counselor is to create more transparency, a deeper connection with the public, a more engaged community with the council itself. And so I think when things like this happen, 
that sort of breaks the trust, the transparency, the openness, the, I think the, the sentiment of like leaving our arms open for the community to come in and talk with us, this was really closed off. And I feel like blocking the community off of being engaged. And one of the things that people really wanted to see as a result of the July 5th incident was connection with, with the community, connection with the PD and understanding. And I think a lot of people spoke to the fact that they were upset because there was no response. There was no formal response. People didn't say how they feel. And again, I was not at any of these meetings, so I do not know what actually happened. But what, from what I heard, a lot of the PD were able to express their feelings. And I think that that could have been a magical moment for our community had they been invited, had they been involved, had they been allowed to hear these things that they have been asking for. They have been asking for us to know, to feel connected, to be involved. And I think that's how we build community. That's how we build trust is to, to let them come out and share their feelings with the community. Let the, feel, the community share their feelings. Like we, we need to do these things. This is healing. Again, what Dorothy said, I know I'm echoing a lot of her sentiments, but I feel very deeply about this, that whether or not this was a violation of the, of the meeting law, again, I feel I cannot speak to because I was not there. And again, I would like to see the public records request before we make any formal decisions about that. And I think as attorneys, it would be helpful for them to have so some documentation to prove these things but something wrong happened. This was wrong. This was not the way we should have proceeded with this. It was also not made clear to me in the invitation in my email, what was going to happen at this session, what, was, what we were gonna be talking about, what it was for. I think these things, this is important information for us to have as counselors. And I think what we want to do as a council is connect with the community. And so therefore I believe these things should have been shared with the community. And so I just think we went about this wrong. I think we could have used this as an opportunity to connect people and departments and to bring community together. And we didn't take that opportunity. Um, and so I feel very disappointed about how this happened. I also feel because of that disappointment and because of the lack of transparency, I feel very interested in knowing what actually happened um, and I also feel very interested in knowing the origin and how that meeting came to be and why we didn't decide to share that when we share so many things with the public and we have so many rules around how much notice we have to give people about certain things that are happening and how much we do choose to share with the community why we chose not to share this. And so I feel like this just leaves me with a lot more questions then I feel like we as a council even have answers to. I don't feel like we as a council have the capacity to even answer this question. Uh, Michelle? Um, yeah, I just, I wanna reinforce what Alicia said. Um, because these meetings happened um, in, a, in a private way and not in a public way, there is no recording. We can't go back. We can't see what was said. Um, most of us, we weren't all at every meeting. So for me to make a determination about two other meetings that happened and whether there was an open meeting violation, uh, there was at least one meeting in which there was a quorum of a committee present. I don't know what happened in that meeting. And so I don't know what happened in the other two meetings that I wasn't at um, and we have no way of knowing. So to ask us as a council to determine if we've um, violated open meeting law is a very difficult um, task for us. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is, and I shared this with Paul earlier or last week, um, I don't, I'm not a lawyer and I don't know whether or not we violated open meeting law. And so it's, challenging for us to have to make this determination. But what I do know is that something felt really different to me about those meetings. Everything that we do and that we have done or that I have done as a counselor has been in the public's eye, in the public's view. It's been encouraged um, to 
have meetings posted, have subcommittees posted, have, if there's any thought about having any sort of listening session or listening, uh, you know, uh, opportunity, it's something that we discuss as a council. And so being in that room and, and, and I so appreciated that members of the police department were willing to share their experience. And I feel that we actually did them a disservice in this process because they had something to say that as Alicia said, the community needed to hear. And we can make an argument that maybe they wouldn't have spoken so candidly if it had been a public meeting. But if we had created a container with facilitator and an environment that welcomed healing um, and that was above board and that was open to the public, I felt really, really brutally uncomfortable in that meeting. And I know that that means that something was different. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean there was a violation of open meeting law. Um, I do want to ask specifically about that. Um, so as I understand um, deliberation, an oral or written communication through any medium, including electronic mail, between or among a quorum of a public body or any public business within its jurisdiction. Um, I'm wondering, I don't, I'm wondering if the process itself uh, if we might consider that the process itself could have been a violation of open meeting law um, in terms of how the serial communication, I would have, what I would have thought would have happened in a situation like this is a counselor or a couple counselors say, hey, we want to hear from the police department. Let's go to Lynn. Let's ask Lynn to put it on the agenda. Let's talk to the council about how we're going to uh, move forward with that um, and how the council wants to proceed. But these meetings were scheduled. The body that deliberated was the council, but the body deliberated outside of a public meeting about whether or not to hold these series of meetings. So I have that as an open question. Um, and again, I don't know if there was a violation. I don't know how we could possibly make that um, how we could possibly make that decision being that we weren't at all of the meetings and there's no recording of the meetings. Um, and I, I also told Paul that I would rather us focus our energy. I do understand we need to respond to this, but I would rather see us focus our energy on best practices so that next time we run up against a group that wants to be heard or counselors who want to hear a group, how do we want to organize that? What is our best practices for doing that? And I would really ask Lynn and Anna um, to please put that on the agenda for a future meeting. Thank you. Anika. Okay, so I also agree that there was no open meeting uh, law violation. I was present for all meetings, and um, what I would have thought is that I wouldn't have been the first counsel to do so. Um, when we first started uh, our terms here, I asked uh, the town manager, I said, you know, we are going to be um, interacting and making decisions that impact departments such as the police department, DPW, um, fire department. And I said myself, I have not been there. Um, I have not met these folks. And we had a tour and all of us were there and it wasn't public knowledge. It wasn't publicly posted. Throughout this incident, we have offered our voices, our platform and space for the families and the youth of that July 5th incident, there was never anything which required the public be privy to that. I, the police made it clear, the police department, all of them made it clear when we first went um, for our visits that they have an open door policy. And that's what I did. Um, I find it very unfortunate to be on a council knowing this information was knowingly 
presented to the public as if it was suspicious, as if something wrong was done, as if this was something that excluded the public. There is trust, that trust has been violated on both sides, the police department and with the public. And us here in the council made decisions based on an edited video. We asked families again, and there we asked everyone involved on the side of the uh, youth that were involved for them to speak. We opened our, our, you know, our hearts. We opened this space. We not once asked um, to speak with the police department to hear their point of view, regardless of what your stance is. When I stood in the meeting with probably the majority, the most of the police um, officers, it was my first time doing so and uncomfortable for me as a woman of color and they held space for that. And we're very inclusive. Again, they're more diverse than our, um, than our uh, council is. And I think that the way that this information was presented was really a shame. It was like throwing a lit match in a dry forest there are so many, especially people of color in this community that come from such brutality that involves as well police department and to throw something like that and just kind of ignite, you know, hurt that this could inspire and just, you know, you can't, but you really can't blame some community for responding the way that they did because this information came from us and also from people who hadn't attended the meetings, as opposed to maybe just doing some fact check and reaching out to your counselors first and assuming that the point of these meetings wasn't to find how we could find middle ground to move forward, you know, and to come in as, you know, the uh, Monday quarterbacks as if we need how we're going to move forward um, and repair what apparent what supposedly was wrong with what happened. Um, I'm glad that we offered our ear to our staff. I think that that is our job here as counselors. If you can't speak to anyone, whether whether you agree with them or not, I again, I've said this before, what are we here for? Thank you. Anna. Forgot what button to push, sorry. So I'm going to follow Anika's very passionate statement with some very cut and dry things. Um, and I apologize for that. Uh, I want to ask Michelle a question. I counted the the counselors at each session. I did not see a quorum at any, including in the notes. Could you clarify which session had a quorum? And I apologize. My camera's off. I'm eating an apple. Um, TSO, I believe, had a quorum in... I have to look at the list. Oh, you're saying council committee is not a council of the whole. Yes, I'm saying that there was a quorum mm -hmm. of TSO in one of the meetings. And if you think about that particular group, it's town services and organize, you know, town services. It's possible that something within uh, a discussion at the APD would be relevant to mm -hmm. TSO. Right. And in that case, I think the open meeting law complaint would have to come against TSO specifically. Um, and which feel free, because I still don't believe that it's a violation for, for multiple reasons. I think, you know, um, there was not a quorum of this body and the body didn't, I would argue the body did not deliberate neither in the sessions nor via email. Lynn didn't ask if we wanted the meetings to exist. She said, these are happening. Do you want to join? Right, which is a logistical thing. And we're doing kind of those logistic style items is very permissible over email, such as scheduling, et cetera, et cetera. I think, you know, where what I what I think is interesting and what I'm looking forward to having further conversation on is how we engage with town staff um, across departments because you know, I think this has been a topic since day one. I don't think that it has to do with this open meeting law complaint because I am of the mind that this was not a violation of open meeting law. Um, you know, if I'm in the bank, I'm going to use a real live example. If, if I'm in the bank center and I run into Anika and we want to go visit the Crest team because they're upstairs, you know, is that something that then we should be reporting on anything that they shared with us in that moment, right? So I think that it's, it's important for us to consider how we engage with staff and that there's a lot of difference between figuring out our own 
ways of engagement and breaking the law, right? And so, so I, I think when you actually look at the details of this, it's pretty clear from the KP law opinion that open meeting law was not violated in this instance. Uh, I think that's all I've got. Oh, oh, and then sorry. Um, the only other thing is that some of the things that we're talking about are I understand why they why they feel desirable to folks, right? So saying what it's about or making a formal plan. That's what would it have that's that's when it turns into an actual meeting, right? Is when you you talk about this is the agenda, this is what we're going to deliberate on, then yeah, it's a meeting. It should be posted. Um, but when you go in to say we're here to listen, that's all, and that's all we did, then it is not by the definition of open meeting law. A meeting um, because we are not deliberating. We're not, there isn't an agenda. It's there to listen. Um, yeah, that's it. Oh, and then the public records request, my understanding is that's completely separate from this and they're not um, necessarily intertwined, but I could be wrong if clarification is welcome. Thank you. There is a separate public records request. It's being worked on. It involves a hundred, I'm sorry, it involves 1,083 emails that have to be reviewed and redacted before they can be released. That's not a small task. Um, Pat DeAngelis? What kind of emails? The public records request is a request that all of my correspondence with the police between now and, I mean, between July 5th and, no, and December 20th, uh, and then all of my emails with counselors, which by the way, includes every email where I respond on behalf of the council to the public also involves communicating with you. And that total, which has been retrieved is in the process of being redacted is 1,083 emails. And that is the emails between me and the council is only for the month of November until December 20th. That is what's going on with that. And we're trying to respond and provide at least the first batch of those emails, but those are separate requests. They were not by the same people and they were not connected in the request. Pat? Pat, you need to unmute. I'm sorry, Carol was clapping to get the dog to go out. And I, that's why I didn't come right on, I apologize. Uh, I want to preface what I'm going to say with a quote from Alice in Wonderland, uh, and it was spoken by the caterpillar. Oh, no, it was spoken by Humpty Dumpty. Uh, when I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said, it means exactly what I choose it to mean, nothing more and nothing less. It's a very important quote to what I see happening in many council meetings, which is a playground of words. Uh, an insertion of the word brutal, uh, the uh, insertion of words that make us feel different and uncomfortable. And I'm getting tired of it. What I see and hear or saw and heard at the police department uh, was very interesting. It was a group of men and women who were sharing what it was like to work in Amherst and how their families were feeling and things like that. It was important to hear. Several statements were made that I did not agree with, but I didn't challenge anyone because we were there only to listen. And I have spoken with other counselors uh, in my, uh, on the four years that I've been a counselor, uh, have gone with other counselors to speak to the police department, um, to speak to the fire and EMS department. I have met with DPW people. And I do not expect that I will ever have to ask permission to speak to the town staff unless I'm asking them to do something for me. But if I'm there to listen, it becomes very important. Listening to the fire department enabled me to fight to expand that department. Listening to the fire department did not stop me from freezing two police positions and expanding CREST members from four to eight, even though they challenged me and told me 
that that made that was terrible because they were trying to get staffing. So I'm getting real tired of um, distortion of facts and a real lack of transparency that has existed between members of the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee and this council when we have tried to reach out to families, when we have tried to reach out to the children, when the police department tried, when DEI department well, tried to reach out, they were denied and kept separate by the decisions of one or two people on the community safety working group. It is about time that we come together and stop playing with the word trust and try to establish guilt or innocence using the word trust. So when I use the word, Patricia DeAngelis says, I want it to mean what I truly mean. And I think my words usually do. I would like that from more counselors. Shalini, you've not spoken. Yeah, um, I think I just wanted to say a couple of things. One is the question, since we were all not attending the meetings, how can we decide that? And I think we can all speak for the meetings that we attended if there was a violation. And I can speak to the meeting I attended and there wasn't a violation of open meeting law. There was no deliberation uh, of any issues um, we heard. It was so important for us to hear, uh, at least for me to hear what the police experience has been and how, um, I'll come to that in a moment. But um, and the TSO was brought up. There was there's nothing that the TSO is discussing right now that pertains the police, and there was no deliberation amongst the TSO members that I am a member of at the meeting itself. So again, there was no violation over there. And I do want to speak to the intention um, of what is the intention for raising this question and. Uh, about the open meeting law violation is the intention that uh, we wanted an opportunity for the community to also meet with the police. I mean, was that the intention? Um, in which case we can still do that if we think, and I believe the police has, had asked for the committee members to reach out to them and they've always said they have an open door policy and they have not been taken up on it. Let's say we want, as a council, we feel that, oh, this, we heard something that was so valuable and now we want the community members to hear it. Why not present it that way as a, as a re recommendation? Hey, this would be really great for the community to come and meet. So let's put it that way. Why does it have to be put in the context of, oh, there was an open meeting law violation and there was a lack of transparency. And why are we making these assumptions without asking? Did anyone come and ask me? I haven't spoken to any single person. No one has come and asked me like what happened for you and you know what what was your experience? So how are we jumping to these conclusions without really asking and and also to mistrust our intention without any reasoning for mistrusting the intention of the individual counselors? Yeah, we want to get best practices if that's our intention. How do we engage with the staff moving forward? Let's discuss that. Let's put that on an agenda. But again, why does it have to be in the context of how wrong this was and how we have been so lacking transparency and all of that? All, the emails went to all of us. And if any of us felt there was a violation of transparency, we could have brought it up back then, but we didn't. And that's fine. And now you think, okay, we should. We should make it more transparent. Let's do it. Let's have a meeting with the police formally. But I really, I mean, I would second what Pat just said, that it is very exhausting that instead of actually doing the work for our communities to be thinking of what we should be doing in the youth center, what we should be doing with, what are the best practices? We're spending so much of our time just debating and discussing uh, and mistrusting each other. 
So I really hope 2023 is where we can focus on what is that intention? We want to bring the community together. Let's bring up solid recommendations for what, what we want to do over there. And so again, from my end, there was no uh, violation and I truly appreciated the opportunity. And for me, it was personally important. Again, just the last point, because after reading the town manager evaluations where there were many police members who spoke about the impact it's having on their lives and uh, how what it's like working for the town of Amherst, I was one of the people who wanted to reach out and uh, reached out to Lynn and said, hey, I want to hear what's going on. And so I think it is important in our role to create a safe community for everyone that we do listen to everyone make space. And if we think that we can do this better, yeah, let's hear the suggestions for that without any kind of accusations. Thank you. So before I go back to Michelle and Alicia, um, the question before the group tonight is not how do we move forward, although I think that is the most important question. The question before the group tonight is whether or not you support the motion that is before you. And um, Mandy Joe, at some point you may wanna make your either friendly amendment or amendment. That motion then brings this issue to the next level, it goes on to the attorney general's office. They make a determination whether there was an open meeting law violation. And then from there on, we see how the process flows. However, we're not going to sit here tonight and try to solve what should be the next steps. I think this has been a very useful conversation. There's many times I wish I'd done something differently. Uh, this certainly is one of them, but listening to the police was not something I did would want to do differently. They deserve to be heard, as did the people who came to us on behalf of the teenagers who were involved in the incident on July 5th and spoke for four meetings in front of the council to let us know how they felt. And then we finally went and listened to the police to find out how they felt. And the only difference is we didn't ask them to come before the council to do that. So, but there was no an open meeting law violation. Believe me, I wouldn't have done that if I was. Andy, Joe, you have your hand up. So I know you invited me to make that motion, but I've already spoken and so have Alicia and Michelle, so I believe they okay. should go first. Michelle. Thank you. Um, I want to respond to a couple things. Um, first to Pat, I used the word brutally. I said that I felt brutally uncomfortable and I did. And I'm not sure why there was a judgment passed on that. I'd also like to respond um, to Lynn um in regard to whether if we felt uncomfortable or not we could have raised that concern i did raise that concern with my president i said i had concerns mm -hmm. and her response at the time was if you have concerns maybe you're you'll just maybe you should decide not to come I also encouraged you to call me and we weren't able to find that. I time. totally agree. I totally agree. All I'm saying is I, I, this is not about whether there was an open meeting. I know it is about whether there was an open meeting law violation, but the defensiveness in this conversation, not even to hear the voices of myself or Alicia or Dorothy, I feel entirely unheard. And except for Lynn really just saying now that if uh, she were to do it again, she would do it differently. Um, and I do feel heard in that because I think that's at least what I'm trying to say. Um, I will use the listening session for the AHRA, which is happening on Wednesday. 
and there will be zero deliberation. Mm -hmm. um, and yet I was required to post that meeting and I was required to go through, uh, you know, a, a 30 minute or I was asked to speak for with Athena for 30 minutes so that we could make sure that everything was in its place so that there was no open meeting violation. That's a listening session. No deliberation is occurring. And in fact, I would say that the sensitivity of what would be spoken about in that meeting, I wish that, that there was an opportunity for pe people of color in the community to and, and black residents in the community to be able to speak without having it be staged in public. If, if, the, if that's what they wanted, but I didn't, I don't, we don't have that option. So this is about different scenarios being treated differently, different people being treated differently. And what I'm asking for is to be heard by my fellow counselors that I felt uncomfortable with what occurred. It felt different and it didn't feel like it had the integrity and transparency that I know this council wants. And so to, to reiterate, um, I know this isn't the time for that conversation to occur, but to reiterate that I wanna make sure that we develop best practices together um, that allow us to avoid this situation in the future. Thank you. Alicia? Um, thank you, Lynn. I have a few things to say, but first I just wanted to make abundantly clear because of some of the things that Shalini said that it was nobody on this council here who um, submitted the open meeting law complaint. Like that did not come from any of us. So if you're asking why that happened, no one here can let you know. Um, we are just responding just as much as you. So I just wanted to make that clear because although I am making these statements that I did not submit this complaint, um, so I needed that to be clear. Um, there is so much that just happened. And this is, you know, amongst a lot of other things we talk about, a very difficult conversation to be having on the council. Um, I will again state very clearly that I was not at any of the meetings. And so I do not believe that I could definitively decide whether or not there was an open meeting law violation in any of those meetings. <clears throat> I do have a question about the process and the origin of the meeting and how that came to be. I think someone who was speaking earlier, one of the counselors said something about if they ran into somebody and then they decided to go talk to some people, then that shouldn't be a problem. I fully agree and that is not what happened here. If you and one other counselor went and talked with the department members, that, I mean, I, I don't think there's a question about that. The question is because every counselor was involved and whether or not that was an open meeting law violation, I think that is the question mark. Um, and so I think more clarity on what constitutes an open meeting law violation would be helpful. Um, what was sent to us in KP law is slightly helpful, but to me, I still have questions. And because of the fact that there is no evidence, there is no way to say definitively that any of those things are actually true. Also, I wonder again about the process because if there were a multiple meetings that happened and that were not planned, and then all counselors had access to certain information before decision making, does that not make it serial communicating? Um, and so that's what's unclear to me in this process is how the meetings came to be. What was the origin? Did the police approach us and say, hey, we really wanna be heard, we want a listening session? Because I, it, again, it's not clear to me, transparency, but I do not think that that's what happened. And I also think that that would have been a completely different thing if the, the PD reached out and said, we want to have a listening session. We want all of the counselors to come. We have a lot to say, we have a lot to share. I'm, it's not clear to me that that's what happened. And so I would be more interested in knowing whether or not the process to which got us to those meetings happening was a violation of the open meeting law uh, rather than the meetings themselves. Um, I also agree that it is very important for us as counselors to be listening to 
town employees, to be hearing them, to be hearing their experiences. I know a lot of the decisions that we make affect them directly. A lot of the decisions that we make are what they do during the day. Like what we do constitutes what their job is. So I do agree that that is very important. We're talking about process here and not that, in my opinion, I don't think it's not that that meeting should have never happened, but I'm wondering about how did it come to be? Why was it different than other meetings that have happened that have been similar? And I'm still very, very unclear about these things, which is why I'm saying that it's the, the transparency that makes me uncomfortable with this situation. And when there is a lack of transparency inherently, and this happens in any situation for most people, that leads to a instance of distrust. There is a lack of trust when there is a lack of transparency. This is not demonizing. This is not angry. This is, it just simply is the way it is. When you're unclear about something, when you're unsure, it's hard to trust in any situation. So I just wanted to be very clear because I know that because there is a lot of deep rooted history and on the council itself, things that we've been discussing, specifically the July 5th incident that pertain to this matter, I think aside from those things, aside, even if none of those things happened, when people don't know, how can they trust? Trust is something you have to build. It is something you have to work on. And so, you know, when I was working on the CSWG, that's what we were really looking into. What steps can we take that will help us to build the trust? Trust needs to be restored. And I still strongly feel as though this was a step in the wrong direction towards building and repairing trust and transparency again. Um, so I did want to say that um, and also echo something that I think is very, very important that is being missed here aside from the open meeting law complaint itself in that we should hold space consistently. And so if we're holding a sort of space saying that the PD has an open door policy, that's not enough. That is not creating space for somebody to feel safe, to feel like they can be heard. You're asking them to walk into a building that could be traumatizing. Like you're, cre we're talking about creating space for people. And so, yes, like I am glad there was space that was created for the PD where they felt safe, like they could share. I wish that was shared with more people. I wish we could share that with more people. I wish this was consistent. We did not offer that same type of intimacy to, the, to other people in this community who have experienced things and who also had a lot to say. Just saying, hey, come talk to the PD anytime. That's not it. We have to get, it's the same thing as when you're, when you're organizing, community organizing, and you're saying things like, we need to go out into the community, right? Like when we're saying, we need to meet people at their doors. We need to knock on doors in neighborhoods. If we want people from apartment complexes to be able to engage, it's the same thing. We need to create space where they feel comfortable. We cannot continuously ask people to come into our spaces and expect them to feel okay. We need to create spaces where people can be okay. And sometimes you have to take the extra step to do so. And I feel like we missed a lot of extra steps here. Um, so I'm sorry for rambling, but I feel like this is a very important topic that I hope we can continue to conversate aside from the open meeting law complaint itself. I think this is something we need to talk about a lot more. Um, and I don't think we have the information that we would need to make a decision definitively as a council, an accurate decision as to whether or not this was an open meeting law violation or whether one occurred at all. Mandy Jo. So I'm gonna ask for a friendly amendment and um, because that we add the phrase at the end of the motion, comma, that the town council did not violate open meeting law. And I um, believe it's I you the, and Pat. I made the original motion, who was the seconder? Pat. Pat, do you accept that? Yes. Okay. Are there any other comments at this time? Shalini? Yeah, I just want to capture two things that I've heard, and I'm hoping that we can continue at a different time or have it on the agenda. One is the best practices for engaging with our staff, and in the future, yeah, what that might look like. And secondly, 
I'm not sure if I heard Alicia correctly, but you're suggesting that we create a space for the community to mean in a state, not like in the police department, but maybe a facilitated dialogue with the police and the community. Is that something we should be talking about? Again, that's the next steps, Shalini. Yeah, okay. But just I just wanted to put it in the future so yeah, just think, to just make sure that we're are, capturing some of the ideas. Yes, yeah. I definitely think those are both um, pieces of what I've heard as well. Michelle? I just have a process question, please. Um, we have to respond within a certain amount of days, which this meeting um, falls within. Can our response be that we're not ready to make a determination for whatever reason? We want to wait for public records to come back or whatever other reason. Do we have the ability to have that as our response? Athena. Yes, um, but the public records are not involved in this open meeting complaint. It's specific to the meetings that were held at the police station. There was not an accusation that the council violated the open meeting law via serial deliberation. So um, the question in front of you is whether or not the council violated the open meeting law at those two meetings. Athena, we need to have you speak more into the mic in the future. Thank you. Um, I can't hear her. Paul. Yeah, just to build on that, I, I think you a quorum a quorum of the council constitutes a open meeting law violation. You have the entire council present. So if a quorum if a quorum of the council felt like they violated the open meeting law, they would say that tonight, right? You would have it's the council that this is a complaint against the full council. So the council needs to vote on this. Um, and so that's why I think if you you have everybody here who was involved in that meeting, you know what the law is. You should be able to make a decision whether there is a violation or not. There isn't anything uh, in writing that would help you inform your decision because that inform, you know what the law is. You're all present here today. You can make a judgment on whether there's a violation or not. Michelle, does that answer your question? Um, well, it sounds like the council could decide that we're not ready to make a determination and that could be a response to within the 15 days. Um, I, I guess I'm trying to understand. I, I'm, I'm sorry, Paul, I'm, I'm feeling. Point of information. Yeah. I believe what Athena was saying was that within that 15 days, we could ask for an extension of time to respond, but our response cannot be, we're not able to respond. Like the, there could be a formal request to extend the time allowed to respond, but our formal response simply can't be, we can't decide. Does that make sense? That's exactly what I was asking. Um, and I feel... Honestly, it, it sort of feels like a no-win situation in this council because to from I'm trying to ask genuine questions about this process and I'm getting shade from the town manager about it. I mean Paul when I just asked, you turned around to Athena and said, oh man, I, I'm just trying to ask, okay, well, that's what I perceived. I am feeling like there is no good way to have this conversation because the defensiveness here is just, it's really over my like within it's not in my capacity to handle the kind of defensiveness that is here and so um are we in a position to be able to abstain from yes okay thank you and if you want to abstain and make a statement as to why you're abstaining that would be fine as well alicia Okay, I apologize because I know this is exactly what Michelle just asked. 
but I still need clarity. So we can ask for an extension of time, but the, the vote itself cannot be a vote of, we don't have the information to make this decision right now. Is that, yes? The, the council's decision tonight is to instruct KP law or to authorize KP law to respond to the complaint. That response could be, yes, we violated the open meeting law. No, we didn't violate the open meeting law or we would like KP law to request an extension. Okay, and those are only three options. My understanding is that those are the options tonight. Okay, thank you, Athena. You're welcome. Um, and then my other comment, um, just in response to what Paul said, is that I respectfully disagree that we have the information just because we're all sitting here and we're all counselors who were in the meeting to be able to say whether or not there was a, a violation because how would one person know what happened at all the other meetings? So like possibly each one person could speak to their meeting, but also in the report, the original report, the original president's report, there was not like a list of people at each meeting or a list or like any information about what the meetings, what the meetings were. So again, there's no documentation to prove. And I don't want to make this like, I distrust anybody because I don't, I trust all of you here, but we are just being asked to like, yes, I was there and there was not a violation and that's it. I, there's no anything. Is that really how it works? There's no proof. We're just taking everyone's word for it. Even if we weren't there, even if they weren't at the other ones, we're just, it just didn't happen. Each, each counselor should certainly speak for themselves. Okay. And, um, whether they believe they were involved in an open meeting law violation. I think that's what the vote is about. So yeah. each counselor personally themselves. Well, the, and not counselor. the council as a whole. That's the confusing part because it said this violation was on the council as a whole. The violation is on the council as a whole. The vote is by the council as a whole. If a person votes in favor of the motion, they are voting to say, I don't believe there was an open meeting law violation. If the person is voting against that, they're saying, I believe there was, or, or I believe there was, that they're voting against it, okay? And the other option is the question that Councillor Miller asked, and that is, can we just abstain? Because we don't feel comfortable voting one way or the other on this. And then state your reasons why. Okay, and regardless of the ultimate end decision, the KP law memo in response to the complaint has to be a reflection of the whole conversation that happened tonight or just of the majority decision. Well, there have been some changes requested in the memo. I believe that the KP law memo has to reflect the vote. Is that correct? Is there anything else the KP law memo has to reflect, Paul or Athena? I think the, the council could ask that it, something else be included like had been done earlier. So for example, three counselors or two counselors voted to abstain and here's why. Can that be included? We can ask that that be included. Okay. If that's I mean, I, I think that's perfectly acceptable, but I'm not a lawyer either. Um, Alicia, does that help? Yeah, and I think that, that makes me feel better about it if we could at least okay. include that. But the reason why I'm asking again is because the language itself says that KP law will respond. Um, oh, sorry, I don't have the language right in front of me, but that their, their response is going to be a reflection of the, the council conversation. And yeah. I think that this conversation as a whole is inconclusive. So they're not reflecting the conversation. They're just reflecting the vote. The, the conversation may be inconclusive about, because some people in the conversation feel that they're still missing information. But if the overall body votes to support the motion with the friendly amendment, then that's what gets filed. What I'm suggesting is that for people who either abstain or vote no, 
that we should also include those statements with KP law. I, I'm perfectly fine with that. Does that help you, Alicia? Okay, Anna. So my sticking point is we're talking about an open meeting law violation. Open meeting law, open meeting law has like an equation, right? That you have to meet in order to be an open meeting. That's right. And what I'm stuck on is the the first element of this is that it has to be, and I'm looking at page two from the memo, definition of meeting. This is not something KP law made up. This is pulled from open meeting law, which is a meeting expressly shall not include attendance by quorum or sorry, is a attendance by quorum of a public body and deliberation by that public body. So we can, I understand what you're saying in terms of if I wasn't there, how do I know that there wasn't deliberation? And yeah, that's a fair, that's a fair question. However, if there wasn't a quorum of the public body, it doesn't even, I'm not going to say it doesn't matter because it still matters, but it doesn't even hit that first threshold, right? So the first threshold is that there had to have been a quorum of the public body there. This complaint was directed at the town council. There was not a quorum of the town council at the, at any of the meetings. That list has been provided. So I think that there is so much, I mean, I've got like pages of notes here of things that we should add to our, that we need to hash out as our own public body as a quorum um, that that need further discussion and deliberation. However, where I'm getting stuck is that this has very clear cut thresholds to meet in order to be considered an open meeting and then to have had that violated. And we didn't even clear the first one, which would have been a, a quorum of this body. So I think that's the part that I'm stuck on that I don't see that as something that needs interpretation. And, and I could be, that's my perspective and I don't need folks to share that, but um, that's not information that's necessarily debatable. We have the list of who was there um, and it was not a quorum of this body. There were not seven counselors present. So I hope that that's my reason for, for um, believing that this was not a violation. Jennifer. Uh, yeah, I, that's, I guess where I'm coming down also, it seems that it's, there is some, an objective <laughs> determination of what violates open meeting law. And if there wasn't a quorum, it didn't, but what I'm always uncomfortable is we have to take these votes. Well, obviously that's what we were elected to do, but it, votes aren't nuanced. And I totally hear and appreciate, and it's what, um, Alicia said that with the police department, we went to their space where they're comfortable. And I think you hit the nail on the head because I haven't felt totally, I haven't comfortable with what happened. And I think that was it. We went to them, which is very different than having like the committee come to us and we sh should meet the community with, in their space. And, and that, you know, doesn't, feel like in that sense, we treated the two parties the same. So I will probably, I will vote that I don't think we violated an open meeting law because there wasn't a quorum of the council at any one of the meetings, because I was only at one, so I don't know what transpired at the others, but if there wasn't a quorum, it seems that that's not a violation, but that doesn't mean that um, I'm completely, I'm comfortable necessarily with how it was handled. And I think everybody agrees if we maybe did it again, we would do it differently. I, I, Jennifer, I wanna just say, I agree with you totally. There wasn't a violation. Could it have been handled differently? Absolutely. It wasn't. That, and I think Alicia hit it maybe part of it on right. the head of what was different about. There, I think we've heard a lot of different things here tonight that have to be internalized with the council and they're part of how we move forward. I think one of the ways of moving forward, to be honest, is to just say, vote on this and move on. Because otherwise it's just going to keep sitting out there and it's not going to help us move on. Mandy Joe. I call the question. Okay. Um, the question's been called. That's not debatable. Um, so um, the question, we have is, to vote first. Is there a second? I'll second. Motions, yes. The question's been called, it's been seconded. It's not debatable. 
correct? I'm sorry, I'm too entrenched in the rest of this conversation. So we now move immediately to whether we're not voting on the motion, we're voting on the question being called, correct? Thank you. Um, we start with Michelle Miller. No. Dorothy Pam. Pam Rooney. Yes. Kathy Shane. Lynn, just let me check. We're we're voting on to call the question. Yes. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. No. Shalini Bullmilton. No. Pat DeAngelis. Yes. Anna Devlin Goth here. Aye. Lynn Griesmerson, aye. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Three, one. So it's nine voted in yes, three nays, and one abstention, none absent. So we move immediately to the question. The question that's on the floor is the following. To authorize KP Law to respond to the open meeting law complaint filed by Allegra Clark dated December 20, 2022 on behalf of the town council consistent with the council's discussion on January 9, 2023, that the council did not violate open meeting law. That's the question before you. We start with Dorothy Pam. I'm sorry, Pam Rooney. Point of order. Yes. Is there no additional discussion on the motion? That's what calling the question. So yeah. we're, we can't have any. Okay. Yeah. There's obviously opportunity for other discussion at other points, but on this motion, no. Okay. Uh, Pam Rooney. Abstain. I did not attend any of the meetings. Okay. Uh, uh, Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker. I'm so sorry, Lynn. Can you reread me the motion, please? Yes, actually. Um, to authorize KP Law to respond to the open meeting law complaint filed by Allegra Clark dated December 2022 on behalf of the town council, consistent with the council's discussion on January 9th, 2023, that the the town council did not violate open meeting law. I'm abstain. Thank you. Okay. Um, Shalini Bowman. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Dillon Goth here. Aye. Lynn Griesmers and I. Mandy Johanneke. Aye. Anika Lopes. Aye. Michelle Miller. Abstain. Uh, Dorothy Pam. Abstain. So I have, it's nine uh, in favor, none opposed, and four abstentions. Okay. So the motion passes. Uh, the people who abstained, one of you has already said you abstained because you were not there. Are there any other statements that you'd like to make about your abstention? Alicia? Um, I mean, I would state the same thing. I abstain because I was not there and it is not clear to me that there was not a violation of the open meeting law. Okay. Michelle? I'm not even clear on what the motion that we just voted means. Um, so I, I feel like I, I, it says as a reflection of the conversation, I, I, th that language is really unclear to me um, because the, conversation was diverse so I think what it means is that we are agreeing as a council that there was no violation and maybe that's the amendment that Mandy was trying to that is what add we're in to. right yes. so uh yeah thanks okay uh and Dorothy you were the other abstention uh yes I do not want to say that we did violate the open meeting law because we did not have a quorum because I 
think there are other reasons why we did not violate the open meeting law. And that quorum could be seen as a, a clever way of breaking up the quorum into a series of meetings and not having one big meeting. So, but I, the two reasons would be, I would assume, since I was not there, no agenda and no deliberation. Mm -hmm. However, because there were no written records and I wasn't there, I can't be sure there was no agenda and no deliberation, but I think those would be the better reasons to say there was no open meeting law violation. However, there has been concern raised about the way the meeting was set up in terms of notifying the public and giving adequate notice. And I do think those are concerning issues, but as KP law would put it, I would say we probably did not violate open meeting law, okay. but I feel abstaining is the only thing I can do. Okay. All right. Um, we're going to move on to the town manager's goals. And Athena and I have talked about how to try to organize this. And um, we'll try to see if we can get through them, okay? So various people have submitted changes they would like to see. Athena has compiled that into one document. And we're going to view that document at this point. Um, I think we want to start at the very beginning. There in the fourth paragraph, there is a change that has been recommended. And this, how I'd like to approach this is as follows. If you agree with the change that's been recommended, then that's fine. If you do not agree, please raise your hand and we'll discuss it. We're going to go piece by piece, and there may come a point where we actually have to take a motion. So is there the very first change? I think, well, Athena, what we're of, seeing is still point confusing. Point of question, I guess. Yes. Should we have a motion on the table first if there might be times where we have to do a motion to amend? Sure. So the motion on the table would be the following. to adopt the 2023 town manager goals as amended at the January 9, 2023 town council meeting. Is there a second? Second, that one got there. Okay. All right, Athena, can we see, can we see just one screen at a time, I guess, or? So I just wanted to show, these are all of the changes that I received from counselors and I've incorporated them into one document, but there are places where someone suggested taking out a whole section and someone else suggested changing that section. So it's, I'm sure Mandy knows better than anyone. It's difficult to reconcile those all into one document, but nothing is final. It's just easier to accept and reject changes in this one document. So I have everyone's changes. It's just difficult to show in one place. Um, so especially in sections where someone has suggested a change and someone else has suggested removing the entire section. Please pull your, pull your mic closer, first of all. And second of all, somebody just raised a question. Jennifer? I have my hand this up. This document I'm seeing here is not what you sent us as being the final. Right, Jennifer, the, this is the one that incorporates all the changes that I've received. Pat, the one she's showing is the one we're going to discuss the changes on. Right. And I was going to request that it be made a little larger. I can see it now, but I also wonder if the changes I suggested that today are included or will they have? Yes, yours are in Okay, there. thank you. Thank you. There were suggestions for changes received up till five o'clock or so, maybe thank even you. six. And um, they're all incorporated here. Jennifer. Okay. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Okay. Athena, are you asking for a break at this point? No. No, okay. I'm sorry. Okay, let's go to then to the fourth paragraph under the introduction. 
So that was already in the document that was in the packet that okay. came out of our discussion last Wednesday. So you're saying this had already been accepted at GOL? Well, I left it tracked because GOL did not see the language. They just told me what they kind of wanted and I came up with something. That's why I left it tracked so okay. counselors could see what the change was. Okay. Please read the change and then it raise your hand if you have any problems with it. Anna. Sorry, first problem, me. Uh, so I, the way I'm reading this, it seems present a plan to the town council for accommodating the resources or modifying the performance goals. Are we giving the town manager permission to modify his own goals? No. I didn't no. think so. I just wanted to make sure that was it very was clear. It was intended that he either, the plan would either be here's, here's the, how we would do it within the financial guidelines, mm -hmm. or if you can't do it within the financial guidelines, we need to modify these goals. Great. Which would come then back to the council. Back to the council Thank saying you. both of those. Would what happen. do I do? Basically, right. what do you want to do? Which yep. one? Perfect. Thank okay. you. Are there any further questions on this one? Are we ready to accept it? And Paul, I really want to invite you to make comments at any point in time too. So we're ready to accept this change. I'm seeing no hands moving on. Let's accept it and go on. Okay, Athena, in the next one, I think you said you got different comments. And I think, let me just raise the issue that comes up here for me, okay? Some people feel the goals that we are presently working on, the bylaws, et cetera, that we are presently working on should be included in the goals. Some people, for some reason, feel they shouldn't be. So it's an overall decision. And in this case, it's the issue of also, is this achievable within, what, what is achievable within the year that we have of our, left of our term? So Pat? Thank you. I'm suggesting under climate action that we remove um, number three about the waste hauler bylaw and also for E support the work of developing a solar bylaw. I have another thing I'd like to do in community health and safety, which I, which We're is- We're not going the, on to that one, we're staying there. Okay, but it would be for the same reason. I believe that the simple addition of the phrase um, under um, developing and revising legislation to, if we made that change in section seven, the relationship with the town council um, of the town manager, go, the town manager goals, uh, it addresses the support that we need. Wait, wait, what am I? Okay, I, I'm sorry. I'm reading the wrong thing and I totally blew something. I am concerned that we're listing in the town manager's goals, both new legislation and revisions to le legislation that have not been voted on by the council. I find this deeply problematic. And I happen to support the three things that I would like to have removed, but I am suggesting we remove them because they do not belong here. And if we simply add in section under the uh, uh, section seven relationship of the town manager with the town council, uh, and if we simply added to that number one, developing and revising legislation, it covers all of the three things that I'm asking that we remove. Um, this is again, where we haven't voted on waste hauler, we're, at, you know, and so it doesn't belong here. Uh, what belongs here is, is that we need support from town staff and the town manager. And believe me, I support the waste hauler bylaw, but it does not belong here, nor does support the work of developing a solar bylaw, which I also support. Okay, I wanna limit this discussion to five minutes. It's now 11, no, it's 10, 13. Uh, Shalini. Um, so the reason I think we do need to have that specifically stated is because we have heard from Paul in our TSO meetings um, that, that uh, do, direct resources for the staff to study this issue and come up with a plan. 
uh, or alternatives, the town council has to support it. And so I think by stating and and Pat, we are not saying that we are going to implement. It says and if adopted, start implementation. And so what is what we are asking for is just the town manager direct resources to uh, look into it and come up with a feasible way to do it. So yeah, which is why I feel it needs to be specifically stated. Okay, uh, Pam, agree, Jennifer. Should I propose the language? Sure. Okay. And again, I agree with Shalini. The town manager has spe has specifically asked that if we want uh, staff at, uh, dedicated to doing the work, I mean, no, the bylaw hasn't been passed, but it's not going to get back to the council in any kind of form for the council to vote on unless we um, follow the town manager's request or respond to his request to include it in his goals. So I am asking that for uh, number one, climate action. Objective number three, if the language could be reinserted, take necessary steps towards and support the town council in developing a waste hauler bylaw that is feasible and meets the goals of offering universal curbside compost pickup and pay as you and a pay as you throw fee structure. Um, and again, there is already a solar bylaw working group, which is also different with the solar bylaw that was that is working on the bylaw on the solar bylaw the waste hauler it won't be worked on unless it's in the town manager goals um i'm going to just also comment that if there's something that we need town resources and the town manager is going to have to come back to us on then it does seem to me it needs to be reflected in the goals whether this reflects that and what's feasible in this year is unclear Jan, uh, Mandy Jo. So a couple of things. I support removing it, but I do actually have a question because um, I think some of us are coming at this from different things. CRC has been working on a rental registration bylaw for nearly a year, and we've had town staff support. And I think that's been because it's in the goals under council interaction with the manager that you need to support the committees. Right. Um, so what makes this one different than that? And so I guess that's my question to Paul. And I wonder if what I'm hearing from some counselors is that TSO isn't intending on writing the bylaw. They want someone else to write the bylaw, but I thought we referred this bylaw to TSO for TSO to write the bylaw. And so now I'm really confused. And so I'd like to hear from Paul, um, does he need it in here or does the support that uh, Pat was talking about adding into the goal about council support and council interaction, would that be enough? So I did ask for this to be enunciated in the bylaw, as the counselor said. And the reason for that is that we're getting a lot of initiatives from counselors, and then we counselors are have learned to come and talk with the staff before they become more, you know, they develop their own initiatives, which we appreciate. But the problem is that each of these initiatives requires staff support. So if this is this is a major initiative, will we'll require a substantial amount of staff time, um, and. And so I think that this is the type of thing that I would ask for the council to say, yes, we want you to dedicate time to this. And then we would start to outline the amount of work that's going to take to put together a proposal for a waste hauler bylaw. Um, and so it's hard for me to dedicate staff. And, I, and we have learned a lot from our zoning experience about how much time it takes to support all these zoning amendments. Um, that's a different animal because the zoning bylaws originate with the town council. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that that's, I just want clarity from the council in terms of allocating our staff. And because as more of these come up, we're trying to struggle with meeting the demands. We're, um, we're spending all of our staff time on supporting these things. And I want to be able to enunciate, ex I mean, I'm not being very ex clear about this, um, but I'm, I want the council in my goals to tell me what you want me to do this year, um, because there's a lot of things happening in mid-year that, that are expecting staff, staff work put into it. Is that, it's Can not I clear. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I, I'm confused. Does that mean if we don't include like the lighting proposal that's already at TSO or the bylaw that we just referred to CRC and planning board on duplexes and all in your goals that 
you're going to decide not to support that? I guess I'm just confused. You're saying, oh, if it's not in my goals specifically, I'm not going to dedicate staff time to it. But our goals say that you have to support our committees, and these are already in committee. Right. So, so what happened? So, I mean, I think this is a really good conversation because what happens, you'll have a couple of counselors who come up with an idea they would like to pursue. It goes to the council. The council says, sure, let's look into it. There is no identification of how much staff time these things are going to take. And so I think that it's really valuable to have this, a sort of conversation. And it's, it's sort of a chick, chicken and egg situation because you don't know what you're going to do until you have more information. Um, so I'm trying to wrap my arms around the, the many initiatives that are coming from the council. And so one of the things I said is before I start dedicating staff time you know, from the DPW into this process, I wasn't really sure if the council was fully behind it. And I was, I was using this document as an opportunity to say, yes, the council really wants to do it. Yeah. I'm sorry, use your mic, please. Some some um, proposed bylaws or bylaw amendments take more time than others. And this was going to, because it it's would a be- a your effort. Right, and this had to do with the town administering a service it hasn't before. So it will take right. more time to work out. Right. Hold on a minute. Um, Alicia, I know you also have your hand up and this is something you've been sponsoring too. Alicia? Yes, thank you. I won't take too much time, but I just wanted to support um, the amendments that Jennifer suggested and in terms of um, keeping this there. Um, and so then I also just wanted to support that we were told that in order to move this forward, it needed to be in the town manager goals so that staff um, could apply time to it and so that we could come up with I mean, literally was what it says that an implementation plan that is feasible, which we cannot do without the staff's input. Um, and so I support keeping this and adding the amendments that Jennifer proposed. Thank you, Dorothy. Uh, well, on this issue, there was never thought that the members of TSO are going to create a piece of legislation uh, from what they thought it might be. It was always understood from the guidance that we received from the town manager that the staff that would be enforcing this would have a lot of input. It doesn't mean that whatever they suggested would be accepted by TSO, but it was, uh, Mandy Jill thought, oh, we were just write the law ourselves. No, that was not the intention. Uh, it was to consult this with the staff to see what they think could be how it would work. And I gather they have thought about this at some point in the past. So um, we have to include it in the uh, town manager's goals if it's gonna be worked on. But I have another suggestion that was mentioned. There used to be, and I'm a little vague on this, but you'll know what I'm talking about. An opening paragraph on goals that referred to on climate change, referred to something, the 2018 goals, and it was in the past, it was there, but it was removed this year. I think if that were put back, um, that would be a, the general statement that would. Um, the the very good. first lead sentence says to continue to make progress on the council's climate action goals. Those are the goals we took action on in 2019. The, the date of the vote was removed, but the climate action goals are still in there. So, so that's there because at one point that was gone. But OK, I'm yes. glad that's there. Thank, Thank you. you, Mandy Jo. Thanks. I, I really want to recognize Mandy Jo has really been managing this document. So. There's times I may have to rely heavily on that. Andy? Yeah. Uh, the uh, one thing that's a little bit awkward is that uh, this didn't arise from the climate action plan itself, but does fit into climate action and uh, will achieve some of the climate action goals. But I think the one of the important things to remember is that the council did discuss it. The council did vote to refer to TSO and ask TSO to work on developing it. And um, steps have been taken, including uh, the town manager and uh, DPW obtaining um, a grant from uh, DEP for technical assistance. And uh, so we are, uh, moving in a direction, and uh, it would uh, therefore uh, strike me as totally contrary to uh, the referral and the steps taken since the referral 
to now uh, not include it, to make a decision not to include it, I think it really does need to be there. I'm hearing consensus that we should add this back in. And unless somebody disagrees with that, I'm going to continue on. Okay. And what about the end if adopt, adopted? That wasn't included in what Jennifer said, so I wasn't uh, sure. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. That should be there. If that should be so, there. Yeah. So I would say it shouldn't if Paul just said it's a multi-year effort. Okay. <laughs> he I, said I, this I, would be a multi-year effort to get even the bylaw developed. So no, I don't. It's a, it, it should be there. I, I actually couldn't read it in this. It was so s small. Hmm. Are you saying it should be there? It should be there. I mean, the language that was there when we started the GOL meeting or that, it should be, and if adopted, start implementation, which I think. Yeah, I frankly agree that it should be there because if it's adopted, we would start it. If it's not, it continues on to the next year. This is the concept that some of these goals are in fact multi-year and we recognize that. Yeah. Is there an objection to that, Shalini? No, I just wanted to um, say yes to that, but also just clarify that TSO is uh, writing up the bylaw. So there seems to be some confusion okay, around that. Okay, gonna... yeah, okay, I'm fine. I'm putting my hand down. Bye. Moving on. Uh, okay, moving on to the next area of this one. Develop and begin implementation of a plan for community stable sustainability support, which includes heat pump programs for residents and utilization of PACE program for multifamily and business retrofits. Um, comments. Anna, you have this. Yeah, this one was mine. Um, so the just I wanted to clarify what these were. Um, this is something the heat pump program has already begun, as is my understanding. And so this is really kind of a continuation of of a goal. Um, and heat, the heat pump program would be primarily for, I, I believe, single family homes, whereas the PACE program is a funding opportunity that would go beyond simply heat pumps for multifamily and business retrofits. So I tried to to put them together because I feel that they're both they both relate to this idea of community sustainability support, right? It's not it's not um, about municipal buildings, which are covered elsewhere in this in the goals, but it's two initiatives that we um, have already begun work on and need to be prioritized as part of our climate action. Um, building uh, sustain, uh, excuse me, um, retrofitting buildings and and providing heat pumps. It's one of the largest ways that we can address our uh, emissions. Mandy Joe. I'd say. So the only part of this I object to is the end begin implementation on because we don't know how long it will take to develop and it's not if developed begin by putting and begin imp implementation on it means we expect it to be developed in under a year and then begin implementation and we're asking too much of the manager. I would agree. I hear, I hear what you're saying. Oh, sorry. Can I respond? Do you accept that on? Well, can I respond briefly? Sure. To, um, the the begin implementation came from the estimate from um, ECAC because this has there has already been progress made. Um, I would prefer to see it in there. However, if the council does not believe that it's possible, um, I mean it, it's a little tough. I think that I would I would ask Paul and it's it's hard for it's hard for us to make that estimate right when we don't know the ins and outs of the program. But I do hear what you're saying, Paul. It, can we say develop and if possible begin implementation? Okay. Sure. Yeah. Develop and comma if possible. Okay. I think we're ready to move on to the next one, which is we eliminated the solar bylaw, yet it's an active thing that people are spending a lot of time and we have a consultant on. I don't understand why we would remove it. Pat's got her hand up and she'll probably Pat? say. Yeah, I'm saying I'm withdrawing it. I That's fine okay. to leave it. All right, we're keeping that in.
Okay, we're moving on to community health and safety. Continue to support revision of residential rental bylaws. I think we've basically said if we're working on it, it should be here. I think so, it was part of Pat's. Yeah, yeah I withdraw. It didn't, okay, so we're putting that one back in. Uh, next one is down what is now three. Identify the need that was, for that was explore. that was mine, and it was just that I think the I, the need has been identified. It's really explore options, so I just got rid of the extra words. I actually don't think the need has been identified. I think the wish has been identified, but there was supposed to be some further study about how it would happen. Paul, do you want to speak to that? Um, we have not done a needs assessment. We are exploring options for a youth empowerment center. Um, if you, you know, one of our things would do, we would be doing any way is exploring the need for it. But I think okay. um, we're sort of simultaneously moving forward and looking for what, what the options are for. So if we go with starting with explore options for, it's acceptable? Either one is fine. Okay. Then we'll go with explore options for. And the timeline was added in. Yes, go ahead. I think that's understood because I know Pamela's working on it. Economic vitality, there's no changes. Housing affordability. Prioritize initiatives, including federal and state grant opportunities. I, I love the I love the idea, but the reality is we do that anyway. Um, not sure why it's needed. Any other thoughts on that one, Pam? Take it out, Jennifer. The language in number four added back in. Develop um, proposed strategies to stabilize and increase the non-student population in town. I think if that's not a priority for the council, you know, that, that I don't know why we're here. <laughs> My question on this is how would you do it? <laughs> I think it needs to be a priority. That is something that we are, that the town manager and the council is mindful of, certainly in housing affordability. I mean, we have a bylaw you know, proposed amendments for the zoning bylaw that's supposed to be getting to just this. So I think it needs to be, um, and again, I'm just gonna quote from something that jo John Hornick wrote. This was going back to 2017, where he is talking about how um, there is, Amherst has been, he documented hundreds of families that have the decline in families in, of Amherst. And he says, quote, it is a trend that we must not only stop, but actively work on reversing, unquote. And I think it just, it needs to be out there as something that the council and the town manager is mindful of. And it's essential that that somehow be a priority. Any town that is losing population and year round population in Amherst should be concerned about that. Okay, Paul, you I don't see what up. we lose by putting, including it. So, Paul. So, thank you. So, I don't disagree with the goal. I guess I think about this in ten months. What would I give to you that would show that I've met this that's, goal? And that, I would just a uh, little. Well, I guess maybe with the bylaw that is going to be the, that the the duplex, the zoning bylaw amendment that's going to be coming. Maybe that's something that would be that something when the that would planning this. board will be, or the planning department will be working on that, that this be some a lens through which they look at that. Paul, does that? Okay, so so bylaw changes is what you would think of in terms of, okay. in, or bylaw initiatives like the duplex would meet this. Yeah, goal. I would think that that okay. bylaw Fair initiative, enough. that could be a way to achieve this just to ensure that it does. I mean, the other thing that we keep talking about is looking at various in growing federal and state programs about housing ownership mm -hmm. comes definitely into this, but that's also included in the first time home buyers up above. Um, I'm just looking for hands that Mandy Joe, have you so I'd make that a do I have to make that a motion or just I don't we don't need a motion yet. Mandy Joe. Any so questions? I'm the one that suggested getting rid of it because I see it overlapping of number one. Um, 
it's very general. Um, Paul's question was very logical. What, what would it be? We have a master plan um, that talks about housing and everything for both student and non-student populations. Um, I'm always concerned when we single out one group, um, which is why later on there's another deletion. Um, but, you know, Jennifer, with what you just said, that bylaw proposals that Pat and I in some sense just sponsored uh, might address it. I'm not sure I see much of a difference between number one and number four. And I think it needs to be looked through. It's like looking at a climate lens. I think that's the lens. And I think that maybe this helps us not um, sort of uh, have it be, I don't know, a trigger. We, we are a college town and we have, you know, students and non-students. And I don't think that should be a concept that we, you know, um, triggers a negative, re you know, and add, uh, uh, there's any negative connotations around that conversation. I think it is extremely important. We are a town that the census has said our non-student population is declining. That's a fact. And I think that the town council and the town manager should be developing strategies and proposals, however, whether that's through bylaws, to try and stabilize and reverse that trend. So and this is under housing affordability. Yeah, I think it, I think a major, I think that our housing, I mean, this getting to another conversation for the last several years has been new housing development has been to serve one market. And that's not a market that is helping to stabilize um, or increase our, uh, year-round non-student population. And I, 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 I kind of can't believe this is controversial. <laughs> Paul, you still have your hand up. Dorothy? Yes, I would like to say why that should stay in. Uh, first of all, the other part was talking about home ownership. And this does not specifically say that because um, one of the strat we need to propose strategies to stabilize, okay, uh, and increase the non-student, or you could say year-round population. Uh, to stabilize, that would mean doing something about single-family homes being turned into rental opportunities where people make huge profits by renting by the room. That's not to do with home ownership, but there are things that can be done that must be done to stabilize the housing supply. Uh, the and that's uh, those housings are those apartments are not affordable okay for people who are year round or people who are not year round so it's not repeating that first part which is about home ownership and that says low income and moderate and um the rents that are going that are being charged now are are way beyond moderate they're in, getting into the stratospheres for not much so i think stabilize is a very important word in, and we should keep it in. Um, I just want to note there's about seven hands up right now, six hands, and we are not going to stay on this much longer. So we're either going to quickly make our comments, agree, disagree, make a motion. Alicia? Um, I very quickly agree with Dorothy and Jennifer. Jennifer? Yeah, I guess if we want, why it's also under housing, um, you know, if there is a trend that houses don't go up for sale because they immediately go from the, you know, a realtor notifies um, investors and LLCs that a house is for sale and then they're able to make, buy it Gen all cash. I mean, that, that and homeown, you know, potential homeowners, um, owner occupants don't even have a chance to be in on, on that uh, conversation or that transaction. I mean, I think there's many things that come under housing that um, speak to stabilizing our year-round population. Could, could I suggest a friendly amend amendment? Explore strategies to stabilize the year-round population in town. Can we say an increase? Can I just suggest that when you have a declining birth rate, having anything that says increase is really a challenge. 
I have no problem with it, but I just want to be very clear that declining birth rates don't support increase. But we're not just talking about people with children. <laughs> we're talking about the whole country is in a declining birth rate, and the Northeast is worse than any place. College students are declining all over the country, but UMass is growing. For the moment. That's a later discussion. Uh, do we accept this much? Yes. But then it, didn't you just say year round? You took the I word said, out. I, to increase the year round population. And, and you you took out and increase. But I, we'd like out, to I just want to stabilize it. The year round population, not the non The reason I didn't say year round is I've been corrected on that. Some people say, well, students are some, some are here year round, but that's yeah. fine. You all, students are here year round. They are. That's why I say non student. That's why I said it because I non student population. All right. Um, Anika? Um, I thank you for your amendment. I just wanted to say where I, I agree with the intention here. I think that if, you know, we should also be mindful that if we do not want to turn into just a, a student and senior citizen community, I think that it is important that we're changing language like this that welcomes students because, you know, these are going to be, you know, the young families that you want to be here to, you know, after they're here to invest themselves, their business and, and stay here. So we want to, you know, I think that the more that we can say year round and take out like identifying non-student. I'm fine with year round. I've just been corrected on okay. that. So I have Thank no problem. We seem to have now agreed on the amendment as it's right before you. Let's just move on. You got one little piece there, Deanna. Okay, major capital building projects. Keep scrolling up. I don't think there's anything here. Oh, it was to remove the idea of an alternative plan if necessary. Kathy, I think this was one of yours. Is this a big issue for you? It, it's not a big issue to remove it since Paul said he's doing it. Okay. But it's removed. It's, it signals that we all think we need to have one. Yeah. So. Okay. Racial equity and social justice. Um, we're going to make a Scribner change above, which is incorporating. Just go ahead and accept that one. And here is where we get to the issue of, do we just go with police or do we go with public safety departments? Paul, you had a question, your hand raised. Yeah. So I wanted to address this because I just want to make it clear that this was not, this was, um, not identifying the police was my request. It was not coming from the police department. Um, my feeling is that we've just hired, created a new DEI department. Our DEI director is working very closely with our new HR director to develop trainings for all staff. And my belief is that I would go to them to say, well, what is your priority for training? And you know, when you talk to them, they would say, well, we need to start with leadership as our first um, priority. And I, I was really, um, I listened very carefully to what Alicia said at the last time when she talked about why police would be one of the priorities. And I thought that was a very powerful argument. And then just as a side note, the police uh, have come to the DEI director and said, we're happy to be first out of the blocks on this. If you want us to, if you want to target us and not target us, if you want to identify us, we're, we're happy to be the first ones. We're used to doing trainings and we've done a lot. So if you want an example department, please come to us. So it's not uh, saying the police don't want to participate. And I think that was something that um, was said uh, previously. And I think I just want to clarify that that's, is, this is not coming from the police, but my wanting to value our new DEI and HR directors and saying to them, what is your strategy for creating an anti-racist uh, community? I think it's really important um, if, if the council wants to use the, use the anti-racist racist language, I think that would be a, a role, as I said last time, a, a good stretch goal for us, not stretch goal, but just something that would put a marker down there on where we're going. Um, so um, so are you saying that the police are willing to go first? They've offered that, yeah. They've offered that to the DEI director. Okay. Anika. Oh, um, I 
I don't know. My hand was up. Oh. Okay. Michelle. I just wanted to differentiate this, um, which is training. Um, and I don't think there was really any opposition to starting with these departments that was sort of added in. Um, it was in the personnel goal. Okay. And I sent an amendment in for that um, where we talk about developing the anti-racist culture. Okay. So are we saying that what we see up here right now is acceptable? Raise your hand if there's an objection. See none, accept it. You still Athena, had a couple parentheses there, back. There was a double go up parenth above. Go at up. the end. Yeah. There's a, yeah. Okay, we're moving on to management goals. Uh, in the administration and leadership, there are none now under personnel management. Um, I'm. We had a couple different suggestions here. I, Michelle, I believe yours was the one that's showing not crossed out. Yeah, mine is uh, the one that's underlined but not crossed out. And I think sort of captures what Paul was just speaking to. Okay. Can I just, my own personal bias can be tested and tracked. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how you test and track an anti-racist culture. Um, I don't think I meant to use the word tested, actually. I did this very late, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, I was trying to say that could demonstrate for other, as you know, to be a model for other town departments. How about that can be a model so we for say to all you. town depart for other town departments? Yeah. Okay. So take out, no, leave, leave that in that takeout can be tested and tracked within the department. I think the reason that I might have had that bit of language in there is just to say that we would actually be um, collecting some sort of data uh, in working with our APD as they begin this process with our DEI department and the town manager to be able to reflect that in the model. Okay, let me try this then. That can be documented. Great. As a model for all town departments. Is there any objection to accepting that and taking the other one off? Alicia? Uh, I don't have an objection. I was actually going to suggest documented, but can it be that is I'm like sorry? that is documented? It is, it says document can, and that is documented. Thank you. Of course. Uh, Anna? Yeah, I have a, I have a question about this. I think one of the things that we've talked a lot about is how unique uh, police are in the, in the work that they do in their origin in all of this, um, all of this that informs uh, a lot of the need to work on developing an anti-racist culture within policing, um, let alone if that's anyway, sorry. There's a whole other thing, but um, within within APD, um, I question whether it's possible. I think it, it depends on how you interpret this, right? So maybe leaving it up to interpretation is fine. But can you take something that is created for a police department and use it as a model? Let me try and, this. Okay. And informs the model for other departments, town departments. Yeah, that feels better. I, I just, I don't want us to copy and paste because I do think that there are important distinctions that will um, be created depending it, on the type informs, of work that each department does. Informs the models for all departments or the models for other town departments instead of all. I mean, I think they all should have some sort of model for developing an anti-racist culture, but... That's better. Sure. Does Great. that make sense? I sorry, I wasn't sure. What word do you want in there? Hold it. One person. Anna. All or, town departments. 
Michelle suggested deleting other. Okay. I think for town departments is fine. Yeah. Okay. Are we accepting that? I so, see other hands. Anna, Alicia, Mandy Jo. Alicia. Sorry, I'm just rereading it. Okay. Okay. This, yeah, I think the edits look good to me. Um, I'm in agreement with them. That's not why I originally raised my hand, but. Oh, okay. Yes. Liz, go ahead. Are you oh, ready? no, I'm just saying that that's not like I originally raised my hand just to be in support of, but now oh. there are amendments. So I agree to the amendments. Great. Thank you, Mandy Joe. So the one thing I don't like about this is that it. For a year long performance goal basically says work on do only the APD, do nothing else for anti-racist culture. Um, because it 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 says do the APD, document it, and that will inform, I guess, later other town departments, but it doesn't say work with any other town departments for the year, you know? So I think we lost something in deleting, fostering a proactive anti-racist culture throughout all town departments. Um, uh, the language that's there could be potentially after that first phrase that has been deleted um, with maybe a starting with or working with the APD to identify them and that then that informs the models. But I think by deleting that proactive anti-racist culture throughout all town departments actually loses something from this goal um, for anything, any department, any staff other than APD. And I, I, I just don't like that. Okay, Paul, you have your hand up. Yes, so I mean, this isn't the universe of work that we're going to be doing. I mean, the DEI department is doing a lot of things that aren't identified in this document. But I, I think a stronger um, goal would be to start with foster proactive anti-racist culture throughout all de town departments and work with the APD to identify steps, something like that, and forms models for other towns, something like that. But I think that I think the foster a proactive anti-racist culture is a really strong statement by the council. And it, and it pushes us um, to move in that direction. It actually gives, gives a lot of direction to our DEI department as well. Okay, so in front of the words work, put in foster a proactive anti-racist culture. Throughout all town departments, starting with the APD and identifying steps. Sorry, and I don't mean to interrupt, but I okay, think that's fine. I don't think you needed to take out anything. I think you just needed to add the foster a proactively anti-racist culture throughout all town departments and and then it's two separate things. Is that I think that's what Paul said. Okay. So comma and starting with the APD. And work with no and work with APT. PD. Okay. And so something work. was taken out. Yeah, that should be added back. Okay. Alicia, tell me what you wanted to say. And work um, with. Sorry. Can you go back to the previous language? Is that possible? Like uh, so, so it would be after departments, comma, and work with the there you go. Yeah, yeah. Just starting with could just change to and and work. Work. Yeah. With. Okay, Anika. I just wanted to confirm. I think you did just say this, Paul, but that this would be with the DI and um, Human Resources Department. Um, is I believe, believe just in brief discussions that their purview is going to um, ensure that you know all departments will benefit from this, and we wouldn't be waiting a year or so. Yeah, so they are developing plans. I mean, our, our uh, HR director has only been here a month, um, but they're developing plans and, and starting um, for, and I, I think, as I said previously, 
their strategy, I think, and they haven't finalized this, would be to start with leadership and have leadership go through the trainings that they and the, that they want, and then move it into the departments because they feel like the way you change an, an organization is through the leadership. And they've done this in other communities, so I or in other organizations. So I, I, my whole response to this was like, let's let our DEI director, who's so talented, lead the way on this. But I think setting a a bar to, with that first phrase, I think, is really important. Alicia? Agreed. Thank you. Thank you. Alicia, this was one near and dear to your heart. You have your hand up. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm not opposed to the addition that Paul suggests here. Um, having that sentence or that phrase before the initiative, um, but I did just want to clarify um, because I think what I had asked for or requested in the GOL meeting was where that the wording for this um, initiative were more closely matched to the wording from the motion that I had proposed that had passed. Um, and so I think this does achieve that because it does have that right in there. Um, so I wanted to speak to support that, but then also to just further specify that the motion itself for this section, and this is the reason why I also support the previous section underneath the anti-racism or the racial equity uh, objective that is referencing training for all town employees. And that's where we included the training and that this section is different from training. Um, and so I also specifically, just in case this, this does pass, which I hope it will, um, providing clarity for the town manager in that when it is said to identify steps to develop a proactively anti-racist culture, it's not talking about training. Um, it's not talking about anti-racism training. It's literally talking about identifying steps that can be taken and that those steps be different than just doing trainings and that those steps be taken within the PD with the intention to create a proactively anti-racist culture. So I just wanted to provide clarity because I think a lot of the times when we're talking about this specific initiative, separate from the one that's above, that we're talking about um, trainings. And while that is like one way to sort of arm yourself with a toolbox to approach these things, that is not like proactively practicing your anti-racism. And so that's what um, I'm looking for here. And you find this acceptable to them? The language, yeah. I just wanted clarity because when we talk about it, sometimes people are always saying trainings, 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 and that's just not what I'm talking about. Anika? Uh, Michelle? Yeah, I, I want to suggest that we remove the second anti-racist culture. I think it could just say and work with the APD to identify steps uh, that are documented and inform models for town departments. I agree. Okay, are there any other objections or changes to this? Paul, you have your hand up. Just to, if I could ask for clarification from Alicia, like what would be an example of, you know, in 10 months when we look at this, that yes, you've met this goal, what would you expect to see? Alicia? Oh, yes. So I think that is the beauty of this because I want you and the APD to decide that together. Um, and so like, I don't, I've never worked in a PD or in a department like that. And so I don't know what protocols are. I don't know what their responses are. And so what I'm really looking for is for you all to be working together to look at what it is that they are doing on a day-to-day -day basis and identify either, I don't know, it could be protocols, policies, uh, things that they say, things that they do that are actively working to combat racism and how those things could be implemented into their day-to-day -day happenings of business. And so like for the PD itself, I have no idea what exactly that would look like, but I think that because you all know the department best, that you all can take the time to sort of think about what you do, think about the small changes that can happen that would achieve that, if that makes sense. Um, and I also think why I think this works well with the uh, above initiative is that once you take or are participating in the anti-racism trainings, that you can take what you have learned in those trainings and then figure out how to apply them to your work directly in concrete ways. 
because a lot of the time when we're learning about anti-racism, it's abstract Mm -hmm. because we're not talking about each individual person. So taking that abstract information and turning it into real concrete steps that we are taking uh, personally or as a department, I think there's a lot of flexibility here in terms of what exactly that looks like. But I think that's the why the documented informing other models is really important because I think what the APD decides to do or what comes out of this will be really important in, ter- in determining what that can look like for other departments as well. Okay, Dorothy, you have your hand up. All right, I think we've come to consensus on this one. So right. let's accept right. and... Right. Make, oh. I just want I just so I just want to say like in 10 months I, I just I don't want expectations to be like we were going to right. change culture in 10 months that you know right. our strategy will be trainings first and then and I I love what you're saying in terms of you think about what the changes are I think that's a real challenge to our staff so I appreciate that um I'm not sure what what our answer is going to be and when I do the self assessment on this but we'll work on it knowing Alicia she'll set the bar high and accept progress uh, municipal services, we're eliminating this. Any questions? Moving on. I'm sorry, Andy. Why are we eliminating it? Um, it, uh, it was suggested. Who I don't know who suggested. Mandy Joe. Yep. So, so um, the reason was because the very first intro paragraph indicates that's the whole goal of a municipality is to maintain essential municipal services. Um, That's why a municipality exists. Um, And so for the last four years, we haven't felt we needed a separate goal for it. And I'm looking at ways to make Paul's job possible and make our evaluation easier And I didn't see, given the introduction paragraph, what benefit adding this particular goal to the performance goals for evaluation provided. Andy? Well, I'm not sure that I would envision it being likely, but if there is a diminution of what the community views as essential municipal services, then where is the council left with a place to comment on that? And I guess that's my concern about removing it. Okay. Uh, in- yeah, Could I respond? Ahead. In number yeah. one, to affect administration and leadership to effectively and appropriate administ- appropriately administer the operations of town affairs pursuant to the charter. That's it under administration and leadership. And then as Mandy Jo pointed out in the opening paragraphs, uh, the fourth fourth paragraph says these policy implementation goals are deeply related and overarching and should guide decision making at all levels of town government and the town's provision of municipal services. Uh, Dorothy? I didn't have a chance to quite totally get what you just said, but municipal affairs, municipal policies are not seen as the same thing as municipal services by many people. Um, and in terms of the town manager, this is the easiest thing. He can say, we, we kept the streets plowed. We provided basic services, you know, because um, they keep scoring this stuff and he's got the records for it. So it's not like this is asking him to do something new or more. Um, this is the bread and butter. So I wouldn't take it out. Kathy? I just have a suggestion. Um, if you look at administration and leadership. Yes. Okay. And it's got, the first is anticipate future needs and position us to meet them. Second is improve the delivery of services to residents and businesses. Why not put a third, maintain essential municipal services? Just plunk it in there. Okay, and then you don't have to set it out as its own little thing because it's all part about administration and leadership. I'm fine with that. Andy? 
I'm fine with that too. All right, we're going to take that sentence out. We're going to move it up. And the nice thing is administration and leadership is really short. So all you have to do is plunk a three there. Yeah, you're going too far. Yep, right there. Stop. No, 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 no. Up higher. There. Right there. Uh, in the second paragraph, to provide leadership, one, take the and out, and two, and then this becomes three. There's three, this thing we just moved. So, and three. And you don't need the word two. You don't need two. You just, no. it's anticipate, improve, maintain. Okay, and then take the word out, be and before number two. And I guess this is supposed to be a semicolon after the word businesses. Yeah, and the M in maintain would be capitalized. Thank you. Now we go back down. We'll accept these changes. Go back down. Take out that whole thing. Okay, finance, anything under it? The effective management and disperse a, a, a ARPA funds with a lens of equity and inclusion and report to the council and blah, 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 and permit fees are appropriate. And, okay, let's deal with an, a lens of equity and inclusion. Any questions about it? Accept it. A question. I'm about sorry, it. Kathy. Okay. Um, I've actually a couple of times suggested, but I don't know whether we'll go along with this, that the next tranche of opera funds be devoted to lowering the taxpayer uh, debt exclusion override costs. So if the lens of equity inclusion would include helping pay for the elementary school, I'm really, I'm fine with this. If it would say, and no, that's not part of the pot, um, I feel it's too restrictive. So I just, you know, I, I think the ARPA funds are to vitalize the town, to meet unmet needs, to do a lot of things. That is why the government. So it's not that I'm against that lens. It's just I have an idea of where we should be spending a chunk of money so that we don't have to ask for as big a tax increase. Mandy Joe. I just wanted to ask Paul what kind of restrictions are on how we disperse ARPA funds and would such language like this limit those those available uses? Uh, this language does not limit. In fact, we include it in our, when we are doing RFPs, this type of language. I'm not sure exactly what the language is, but we have requirements for this type of thing. So I'm fine if it's not limiting. Well, okay, Pat? I, I'm fine. I wanted it there. So uh, what Paul is saying supports that. All right, then we're accepting those two, those set of changes and the Scribner error uh, change. And we're going down to the next one, which is permit fees are appropriate. Is there any question about that one? Seeing none, moving on to infrastructure, ma management, maintenance, and land stewardship. I think the first suggestion was to move the word attractive because word, word ma well maintained covers that. Okay, we hear, I'm hearing objectives. May, Anna Devlin Gother. The word attractive is so personal and subjective that we could sit here for 17 more meetings discussing what makes something attractive. Not I think. To, I said we could, I didn't say we had to. <laughs> um, and I think that that's why I would, I would suggest taking it out. I think we have committees and, and staff who are responsible for knowing what uh, meets general standards for well-maintained and safe. And if we start trying to discuss what's attractive, gosh, y'all are wonderful. And we all have very different ideas of that. So I, I get, I, I don't think that's appropriate uh, to have in there. Unless there's massive objections, I suggest we remove it. Okay, we're moving on. Number four, create a multi-year plan for long-term improvements to and maintenance of public parks, conservation land, 
recreationally and in public ways that ensure public accessibility, safe use, sustainability, biodiversity, and recreation. The idea is to remove it all. And I, uh, Mandy Joe, did this come from you? Okay. Um, so I, I went through this looking at what's reasonable for us to expect from Paul and his staff in one year. Um, and we kept adding a lot of stuff in and this is not start creating, it's not do, it's have it done in a year on a staff that is already down and being asked a lot of on other grounds. And I feel like we've already got plans um, for at least the uses of these things and the long-term sort of plan of them, we have a recreation plan, we have an open space plan, we have a master plan, we have things. And so I, I just don't think this one's, I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel and put that all on Paul in one year. So I would get rid of it. Okay. Pam Rooney. Yeah, I was thinking more from the other direction that uh, we have a lot of pieces, but what we hear a lot of is that, okay, the hiking trails aren't very well maintained or it takes a lot of staff to get out and mow so we don't walk through tick infested fields. And all of, all of this takes staff time. So I think from my perspective, I would like to hear from the conservation department what it would take to raise the bar on maintenance of um, conservation lands we just don't know. And so I think they end up doing it in bits and pieces. I know they try to do it holistically, but having a sort of a consolidated, I'm a planner, so I like plans. Um, you know, what are the pieces that they want to focus on priorities? If you want to get rid of it, I stab myself. Alicia. Uh, so I'm, just want to add to the conversation here because I don't have a definitive like side that I'm on here. I do hear Mandy Joe's sentiments in terms of just adding and adding and adding. Um, but I think, and maybe if someone from the finance committee might correct me if I'm wrong, but that in this also, we were talking about something that I brought up, which is why I think this is where it came from in terms of figuring out a plan for addressing the fields at the uh, high school and that this fell into this umbrella of things. Um, and then, so for that reason, I wouldn't want to take it out. Um, however, I think maybe amending the language a bit because I do think it's unreasonable to expect that all of this will be done in one year. Um, so maybe like changing the wording a bit so that it makes clear that the expectation is not that all of this will be done in one year. I don't even think it's feasible to bake a plan in one year, given everything else we've handed the town manager. That I think is the bigger question. Or to just start considering, because maybe we don't need the whole plan, but, you know, I mean, I don't know, but the town manager knows that managing a town is, there's so many things. And even if this is something that we wanted to look at in three to four years that we should probably start thinking about and gathering information and taking that into consideration now. So let me ask you this. If we say something that waters this down so much, it says explore the feasibility of creating a multi-year plan. By that point, I'm saying you've watered this down so much. Let's just not just put take it, it out. Anna? Um, Paul, well, do you know off the top of your head when the next update of the open space and recreation plan is due? The last was done in 2017. Yeah, I don't know. I know their focus is on Hickory, getting a plan for Hickory Ridge, which is taking, it's going to take a long time just for that right. parcel alone without looking at and the entire town. I'm going to ask the uh, build on that. When is the next master plan due? About 2028. I, I have a follow up question. Yeah, go ahead. So, so I have read the open space and recreation plan, um, and I opened it again because it's been a minute. Uh, so, I'm. I, I think that. Do you, in your mind, does the open space and recreation plan cover 
the elements that are discussed in this goal? And if so, I'm curious if my fellow counselors believe. So I, I initially really supported this and I do support it, the concept of it. And I think the idea of a plan, if we're thinking about something similar to a master plan or an open space plan, those are, those are huge um, multi-year processes. So I'm curious if you think that this is covered by that existing document, even though it's due in a couple of years, probably to get redone, or if you think that this is something different. I, I think that's directed at Paul. I, I think you're looking to do an open space plan update. That's what this is really okay. talking about. Okay. I don't know that it's, I don't know that there's a mandated um, deadline on when it's redone, but it is a process that is redone. It was 2009, 2017. It's in a, it's in a regular cadence. Okay. So the question is, what are we doing with this? Jennifer? I'm sorry. I was skipping down to number seven. I'm so, sorry. I can't hear you. I, I was skipping down to number seven. So should I wait? Okay. Please that? wait. Dorothy, we're on number four. Okay. Uh, I would like to keep this, but to change the verb to just work on uh, part. Of, first of all, it's not like none of this, none of this has been done. I, I, I think that that in many ways these pieces exist in in ways that are above ahead of many other towns. Uh, these are things that uh, some people think about all the time, um, and I think they're very important. So I would just say work on, which means you know, continue it working, maybe organizing a piece here, maybe connecting a dot there, but doing it, not telling people when you have to do it. But I, I do think that there's a lot of work has been started on this and um, it's important. Kathy? Uh, I would just point out that this is, is happening. It may not be happening in a way that we see it. So my examples would be in CPAC, we, they just went through War Memorial Pool and another piece that's been on the to-do list in the capital planning piece. And they have a trail system. Which trails are we doing when with which amounts of money? So that is coming out. So if what we really wanna see is that what's in Dave Zomack and the Recreation Department's vision of what comes next. We have some of that coming to JCPC already that we can't, Puffer's Pond needs to be dredged, but it costs an amazing amount of money. So there is a multi-year set of things we need to do. So I'm just wondering I, whether we're I just trying want to, to note that Mich uh, Councillor Miller has, has had to leave the meeting. So I'm worried that this feels like it's adding something rather than we have a process that's doing this already. I have no objection to thinking of what we're doing, but having sat through multiple recently in the past year where it says, we're gonna do this, then five years from now this, we don't know where we're gonna get the money from to do this, but if we can get a grant for this, we'll do it tomorrow, you know, in terms of the lists. Cause a bunch of these are really expensive. Okay. Uh, Anna? Yeah, I apologize. I don't think I finished my full thought. I, I I would support taking this out given that the way that it reads does indicate restarting an open space plan, which I mean, it's a 140 page document. Like this is a huge, this is a beast, right? And so, but I think it might, what we might've been getting at with this was kind of what Kathy was talking about, which is that we'd like to see for the these different parcels, especially new ones that we acquire, we'd like to see what the management plan is. That feels different than a full open space plan. So I, I do think that there, I, I would support take removing this at this point. Okay. Alicia and Jennifer and Dorothy, you have your hands up. Okay, Alicia. Um, I mean, I'm not, I, I would support a watered down version of it, honestly, um, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna protest it. So I'm just gonna put my hand down. Okay, Jennifer. I, I'm still on number seven, so should I? Okay, no, I think we're taking four out. At okay. some point, I'll put the, my hand the uh, town manager may wanna come to us with some idea about that, but we're taking it out. Uh, we're going on to, what's now six, and then we go on to the words regularly, updated regularly, maintain, and that's already being done. 
No, it all before that, it's because there's a proposal to eliminate delete number seven. I see. Okay. And re deleting number seven, let's just start with that, is to re-examine and, if feasible, create an implementation plan for the bike and pedestrian plan put forth by the Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, Mandy Joe, you you suggested eliminating this, and somebody else made some other suggestion. Uh, Athena, do you know who it was? Jennifer, maybe you were you were the person. No, I wasn't the person. I just was going to ask why it was take. Was it because of uh, too much on the town manager's yes. plate? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I'd like to see it okay. in there, but I'm All right. So we're going to eliminate there. number seven. Wait, wait. How how much does that add to your plate? <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Paul, is that <laughs> burdensome? <laughs> so, so no, because people with, talk about that a lot. It, we, to create an implementation plan, um, I don't know. I'd have to talk with DPW about what it would take. And you know, I think, yeah, I just don't know the answer to your question. My I'm going to just say, I just think this is one of those that's come up. It's a great idea, but not this year. We're, oh, there you are. Um, okay. Uh, Anna? Do you think you lost me? Um, so really quickly, I, just to be really clear, I mean, yes, I recognize that we're putting an incredible amount on the town manager's plate. This plan is from 2018. This is not something that's like a new thing. that's just popping up this year. This has been around. Um, I think that what I would like to see, whether I recognize that maybe creating an implementation plan for the entire plan put forward by TAC may be a big ask. However, I'm wondering if we can build it into number five, where we talk about maintaining a list of future road and sidewalk repairs, incorporating feedback from the, the pedestrian bike and blah, 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 plan, bike and pedestrian plan. Um, because ultimately, the reason why this needs to be in there is that if we replace things as is, we are not improving them for bikes and pedestrians, we are just replacing as is. If we are able to look at our sidewalk and road repairs and say, all right, what, what impacts, and, and this is very possible that this is happening already, but if we look at them and say, all right, this is how we could make this road more pedestrian friendly and, and take that into account as we consider road repairs and sidewalk repairs, that's, I think that would be a great first step if we're not going to be able to kind of take the plan point by point. Can I suggest the following? You hold that thought. We put an and in front of five. We put a period after regularly. And we get rid of this and, and do what you just suggested down below. I mean, if you're saying to do what I just suggested, Is I that fully agree. I think I'm, I want to show you have, you have your hand up. Yeah, I was going to suggest a different edit, but I like Anna's better. So I think that that is fine. Great. Mandy Jo? I liked Anna's and I would support Anna's. So I think it's after road and sidewalk repairs, comma, um, that incorporates the bike and pedestrian plan and that is available to the public and updated regularly. Yes, thank you. Excellent. Look at that collaboration. I knew we can get this done. Keeping moving, we're going to accept all of those changes and we're going on to community engagement. Um, that's a Scribner error. And then we have to look at six, study and recommend initiatives to promote a more child and family friendly town culture, including childcare, recreation, community building options with the goal of making the town more attractive to young families. Can I suggest that way up above where we talked about strategies to maintain or grow or increase our um, year round, that this is part of that and we don't need to spell it out here? It, this is getting too prescriptive. I, I mean, we, when you say strategies, these could all be part of those strategies and 10 other could be part of it. Just, just that it's already been incorporated it's, up above. In housing and affordability, it's, it's included in what was added to the last number of has, housing affordability. 
that that the one that reads under housing affordability um what was it it was strategies or proposed strategies to stabilize the year round population in yeah. town right alicia or pam well since i added it um i think the 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 thrust here is the sort of the friendly the child and friend family friendly and that is every family imaginable town culture but it's the it's the how do we make it how do we make it attractive to bringing let's just say kids into the community with their with their parents <laughs> um so if if it comes out here then it needs to go in as it's it's the kinds of recreational opportunities it's the kind of play facilities it's that kind of thing not just you know stabilizing the year-round population so it needs to needs to be attractions that bring people like downtown I, yeah yeah i guess i'm i'm having a problem with it's a big study and this is just you know like I'm not saying it's not a great idea, but this is not a small thing. And at what point are we just asking too much of the town manager? Alicia. Um, thank you. So I see I, I see what you were saying, Lynn. The only reason I wouldn't think that this could move to the above initiative would be because it was underneath the housing. And to me, this is talking about things other than housing. So like the same kind of idea, but like because it was under housing, that means it was referring to just housing initiatives. And this is the other side of the coin. Um, and I just want to offer, and I, I don't know if whoever wrote this, this is what they were uh referring to but just for me personally the way that this speaks to me um and something that i've expressed to the town manager before is that um the ahra had a listening session that they held in person a couple of months ago um and i went with my kiddos not knowing that they were going to be providing childcare, but they did provide childcare. And it was an amazing experience for me because I was able to be fully engaged in the meeting and somebody else was taking care of my children. And I didn't, and I went to the meeting thinking that I was going to have to be juggling being a mom and trying to be engaging with my community and all of these things and how extremely and profoundly that changed the way I was able to experience the event that I was attending. And so even small things like that, like providing childcare for town sponsored activities and stuff like that. Um, which I don't think is a tall ask, but I don't know if this is if that's what this is meaning. Um, but just an example of like a small a way a way in which this could be a smaller ask because I know that this could also imply bigger things. What's the word we used above? Was it explore? Athena, it was in the housing thing. It said explore. Right there. Explore. Go down. By the way, there's an extra and there in front of the three. So just get rid of it while we're there. But then we're going to go back down. Now go back down below. And I want to see if we can use the word explore so that it's not as prescriptive. So and explore. initiatives explore explore ways to promote explore ways to promote okay dorothy all right i spent years as you know being a grandmother in this town going to every single possible activity for kids that there is and right now we have a wonderful recreation department, but we were never able to use it except for swimming lessons because they do, it's not full day. And a mother who's working needs full daycare. Um, 
And, you know, there's so many things that are not child friendly in this town. So we've had to spend a lot of money on kids. And, um, you know, what the town does is great. And I, I know there's a lot of focus, the playgrounds. I'm so, so excited about the work on the, um, the, the what do we call the, the waiting, not the waiting pool, the, the jet spray park at Groff Park and the, and the playground at Kendrick Park. But in terms of practical things that Alicia was talking about, which is childcare at a meeting, there's a long way to go in services that this town could try to provide using, I don't know, government funds or something that could provide more help to working parents. Okay, I, I think we don't wanna get into how to make this happen, but just let's look at it. Uh, Pam, Kathy. Could, could we put a period after more child and family friendly town culture, culture periods? Because the reason I'm saying that is we have at least a Joe Comerford we're talking, we've been talking about getting pre-K. Uh, we've been talking about extending hours of different things. And this is a money issue. So providing some childcare at meetings would be great. So I'm just, I just put a period because there may be some new money out there um, to, to do this. This is not that we're not child and friendly and Northampton is, or Hadley is. It's this is a problem when when you have two parents working that have children, or single parents that have children. Um, if you want to go out and do something, I'm going to suggest. Kathy. So I just wanted that period. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, I think that the period is a good idea because it's less prescriptive, and at this point, I think that's part of what's making some of this difficult. Is there any objection to that? Okay. Accept all of those changes. Okay, we're on to the next one. Uh, it's simply to add the words developing and revising legislation. Pat. Yeah, that was a, a phrase I wanted added when I was trying to get some stuff removed. I still think it's a good phrase to have in there. Okay, Anna. Can we add the words as requested? I'm sorry? Could we add the words as requested? I think one of the reasons is developing and revising legislation is one of the core jobs of the council. And, and while we welcome the town managers input and and there have been many policies that have been written by staff including the town manager i think it's helpful for us to continue to devise our policy direction um, by adding the words as as requested um i with i think it's a two-way street i think I, i've seen our staff come to us with requests and i've seen us go to our staff with requests sure this leaves it open for that two-way exchange. The, the um, what was it, Article 14 that we had for, for, for three years or something was a staff initiative. Maybe then as appropriate. I'm trying to think about how to not put the council's job inside the goal of the town manager. I, I'm trying to understand what it is you're trying to maintain or do is it that well, developing and revising well, legislation it, it says assist and support the council yeah. in Thank developing you. and revising okay. legislation yeah. is how yeah. it would read okay okay thank you all right accepted move on uh to increase positive relationships yep okay any any questions there none I'm sorry. Uh, so why are we getting rid of developing and maintaining? Because right. we haven't always had relationships with some of these institutions. Right. We have some level of a relationship. I mean, even if 
they're not as robust as we'd like them to be. We have something to start with. Alicia? I think I might actually think it makes more sense to take out increase and leave maintain and develop. Yeah. Yeah, I would argue just, you know, uh, just to keep develop as to develop positive relationships and increase feels like a weird word to apply to a relationship. I know. I'm sorry. Molly, <laughs> how about, how about Molly. to continue to Molly. develop hey, positive relationships? Come here. Well, that develop means increase. If you continue to develop positive relationships, it is an increase. Okay. The town of Amherst in conjunction with institutional growth and change. I have the feeling that this came from you, uh, Jennifer. No, Pam. I have the feeling this next one came from you. Could it be explained? <laughs> So we understand that, you know, as the case today, UMass grows, UMass grows its student population to keep its income stream. And um, I think it I think it behooves us to be aware of the growth. We we should be informed of the growth that is projected by the university so that we can somehow manage. Um, because so many of those, the ramifications are the impacts to our neighborhoods. So um, part of the strategic partnerships with these universities, with these institutions, is that, that we somehow are able to communicate to them what some of these impacts are to the community how many students do we house in the community and therefore you know how are we benefiting them by accommodating all the students um what what does that mean in terms of financial aid to the I, town i can actually give two direct examples that have happened in the last couple of years at one point hampshire college was under serious threat of having to close that was going to have a main serious impact on our community and it was a serious change more recently umass decided to seriously change its academic schedule and it has impacted us the question i have here is the extent to which we have control over any of that and so i i think it's a lovely idea but i don't think we have control over it With, I have no problem with it. Alicia? Um, thank you. So, and I'm not sure if this is what you meant, um, Pam, but when I was looking at this, I think about institutional growth in terms of like uh, student numbers, particularly, like if they're going to increase their, ex their uh, freshman undergraduate class or how many students they're going to be accepting into college or changes like I know they've made decisions in the past um, as to who can live off campus. So for example, if they were to change the requirement that all freshmen live on campus, which is currently a requirement at UMass, that then that would be something we'd be notified of because there would be an increase of students looking to live off campus possibly and that our agreements with the institution itself be reflective of those changes if and when they happen? I, it's a clarifying I, question, sorry. I, <laughs> and I, I have no problem with adding it. I just wanna be very clear, we don't have any control over it. 
well, we don't have any control over the changes, but we have control over the way in which we approach our partnership in response to the changes. And oh I, I'm not sure, but I, again, I'm looking at Pam to confirm that that's what you mean. Kathy? My one comment on this is that that, that phrase all works with UMass, which is growing, Amherst, which is rich, has not changed its student population or the ways of doing business much at all. And I would really like to have a, a strategic tree. So this feels limiting to me to add this here. <laughs> it, you know, so it feels like it's limiting because it's not, it's not just about institutional growth and change. It's about contribution to the town. So that's, I understand what you're trying to. Yeah. So could we say after the it's town of Amherst, including with or with uh, including oh god including factors such as institutional growth and changes that removes okay. the restriction all right we're accepting that we're moving on is this uh, i'm sorry uh, assist the council in initiating supporting state legislative efforts that can benefit the institutions and address the financial. I don't think there's any controversy here. Yes, accept it. Any other objections? Question. Yeah. Why do they need to benefit the institutions if there's state <laughs> legislative efforts? I mean, I, it, so, so for example, a pilot force on the state to change the the reimbursement rate of state-owned land, say, and do it for based on development of the land instead of acreage might not actually benefit UMass. So, but we'd really want it because <laughs> then we might actually get more money from the state pilot than Hadley. Um, who, who added that phrase? Because I'm not sure it helps us to add that phrase. I added it and it was because it was, I mean, we, we write to our legislators supporting certain things. And in some cases we write to support that UMass gets a particular grant or, or you know, we, we add our voice to uh, benefit them. So it, it doesn't have to be in there, but I, but I wanted to make sure that, you know, in some cases we actually could help them if they, in fact, could turn around and help us. It, it wasn't mean that they, everything has to help them. So it's a reminder. It's a reminder. It could come out. Let's. I think for the interest of time, we're going to take it out. Moving on. Oh, my God. I think we're done. <laughs> we haven't passed it yet. All right. I hope there's no further comment. I'm not taking any further comment. Um, to adopt, Pat, Pam, you still have your hand up. Uh, to adopt the twenty two the twenty twenty three town manager's goals as amended on the January nine twenty twenty three town council meeting, it's been made and seconded. No further comment. We're moving on. We're starting with Pam Rooney. I, Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Dobb. Yes. Alicia Walker. Yes. Shelley Belmilne. Yes. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Lynn Griesmers and I'm Andy Johanneke. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anika Lopes. Aye. And Michelle Miller is absent. And so it is unanimous with 12 no, no. people. You didn't ask me. I'm sorry. Dorothy Pam. Yes. Thank you. It is unanimous with 12 people here and one person absent. Good luck, Paul. <laughs> Paul, we'll be sending you sympathy cards along with the manager's things. Uh, are there any committee and liaison reports? Uh oh. 
CRC? Uh, I, I guess I sort of have one. Okay. Um, we're still working on residential rental bylaw, but um, what I want to report on tonight is that this coming Thursday's CRC meeting will actually be a portion of it will be a committee of the whole and a special meeting of the finance committee and special meeting of the whole council um, due to trying to be efficient with the use of town staff time. Um, so that portion of the meeting is to have a discussion with Kim Mew, our assessor, our principal assessor, and um, Sean Mangano will be there about um, assessment of residential properties residential rental properties, things like that. Um, I found out from Andy that they were thinking about doing the same thing. So we were able to work out that this meeting will be the joint one. The CRC's meeting starts at 4.30, but that conversation will begin at 5.30. So the first hour of the meeting will be CRC only meeting. You, you'll get a panelist link from Athena probably tomorrow that will say 4.30 because CRC is starting its meeting at 4.30, but the joint portion will begin at 5.30. Okay, thank you. Elementary School Building Committee, Kathy. Uh, you pretty much gave my uh, where we are this Friday. We will be discussing the new cost estimates and uh, the other piece of discussing that is the designers come up with a list of design alternatives that would reduce the total costs. Okay. Finance committee, Andy. Um, yeah, we're uh, meeting at 10 o'clock tomorrow. Um, and uh, I was hoping that we'd adjourn before midnight. So I wouldn't have to say 10 o'clock later today. And uh, the topic is principally, but not entirely, on the um, proposed special legislation for the rental uh, or for the um, real estate transfer fee. And uh, of course, that's the first step and would come back to the council at the next council meeting if uh, recommended. And the other topic that um, we expect um, is possible tomorrow is that if, uh, um, DPW is able to return to us with information about the effect on uh, water and sewer rates from proposed changes and regulations. Great. Uh, Michelle's not here. And now that you're done with goals, I know GOL has a lot of other things. Anybody want to speak to that, Nanika? I think it's all been covered. Thank you. Uh, Jones Library, Nika? Okay, so uh, the Jones Library Building Committee celebrated the news about Senator McGovern's $1.1 million earmark. Um, also, there was an updated uh, financial status report that showed the project is on track. And there's currently a review of all gender bathrooms, which there's a survey that the, um, the public is encouraged to take part in, and that would be before January 15th. So it's um, a very quick survey, and then there's also options that you can give opinion and, um, you know, uh, just further ex express your concerns about this. And um, so you can find that on the Jones Library, both the Jones Library and the town's website. Great. And sorry, last, that the next meeting will be a joint from the JLBC and the, and the design subcommittees, and that will be on January 19th at 4.30 p.m. Okay. TSO. Okay, so TSO, we haven't met yet. <laughs> we'll be um, so we will be deciding that next date for sure within the next twenty four hours. Okay, liaison reports. Um, I thought we had a TSO meeting this Thursday. Is that not? I, I we'll confirm thrilled. that tomorrow. Okay, great. Don't take it off your calendar yet. Okay, Anna, you have your hand up. I was desperately trying to find the accurate poster and I can't, I'm so sorry, but um, please keep an eye out the uh, Energy Action and Climate Energy. <laughs> ECAC. Energy, no, I'm gonna get it. Energy and Climate Action Committee, ECAC. I know it, it just wasn't working. Um, 
is hosting a, a series, a uh, education series. Oh, sorry, my video is off. Um, an education series, and they have uh, their next one, I believe, is coming up soon. So they've been doing some really great things with heat pumps and insulation, um, focusing on on what folks can know and do around their homes, apartments, etc. So uh, I encourage folks to check that out. And as soon as I get the updated poster, I'll send it to y'all to distribute to your networks. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, minutes were approved under consent. Town manager's report. Happy to answer any questions if any counselors have. You have a written report. Dorothy. Okay, well, um, this is on sheltering, the permanent shelter site. So in, in reading over this, I realized that I wasn't sure what was happening. Um, at the new building that the town I, is in the process of buying, the, the um, Amherst Veterans of Foreign Wars building, um, it's gonna be both a shelter and supportive transitional housing. So my question was about that shelter. So right now we have Craig's Doors, which is a wet shelter. I'm kind of hoping that the shelter that would be in this new building would not be a wet shelter. And I realized I don't know the answer, so I'm asking you. I think the intention, it, well, we're many years away from this becoming a reality. It will take a lot of time to develop the site. Uh, if Craig's Doors is the vendor who would take on this, would, the responsible party for this, they aren't, their mission is a wet shelter. So the town has always hosted a wet shelter, but that's a decision down the road in terms of what we would put into the RFP for such, for the development of the site. Okay, I believe- Just because, I mean, I think that providing the wet shelter is a, is a great and necessary social service, but I was hoping that for this building, which had residents, that it would be a, a, an additional shelter because you, right now you have people housed in uh, hotels and various things and I was hoping it would be more like that. Okay. Anna? I, I believe the preferred phrasing is behavioral shelter just for, for future reference. I believe the phrasing that's preferred is behavioral shelter just for future reference, not wet shelter. No, no, no. The word I just our, learned this. I learned the word from our memos. You, you know. No, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm sharing something I just learned from um, Jerry Weiss of Craig's Doors. Um, and, and the other thing is Paul, is my understanding is correct that if Craig's door is, is selected, that the other shelters would be moving to this location. It wouldn't be an additional, um, a, an additional so many beds. It would be a shift over. Is that correct? That's, I would think that that would be the capacity for Craig's doors, but yeah. I, I, I can't comment on what their Thank mission you. would be. Any other questions of the town manager? I know he'll be more than willing to answer them at some hour than now. Um, regarding town council comments in your um, meeting packet tonight was the addendum requested by Councillor Miller uh, that described the meetings with the police. Unless you have questions about that, the meeting, the records, the uh, report stands as reported. Dorothy. Uh, this is on uh, page seven when it's talking about the new business grants. And uh, going into details uh, to say to apply for this grant, you must have a preliminary business plan, including concept, budget, management plan, and a found space that would be suitable. And I re remember reading about things of this type in other places. And I'm wondering, are you providing workshops that show people how to do that? Um, because that's a lot of really technical stuff. And I, I was thinking if you're gonna be really um, in inclusive that maybe such a workshop would be a good idea. So I'm just wondering, is that in the plans? Paul, this is in the manager's. A, a workshop to do what again? Well, for example, what if I wanted to apply for one of these, but I had never presented a, um, a preliminary business plan with a concept, a budget, and a managerial plan? I mean, um, at community yeah. college, that's the kind of thing that they're often there, classes and workshops that show people how you do that. And I'm wondering if, instead of just announcing this, that there would, would, would the town be providing a workshop to help people put that together so they could apply? Yeah, so, so these are very short time um, frameworks for, for providing the grants. These grants are designed for businesses that are up and running, and that's the first group. And the other one is for people who've already come up with, the, with plans. And there's a lot of people who have ideas for a business. They have a preliminary business plan. We can help them develop those things one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but um, I don't think we plan on doing workshops on how to do a business plan. There's plenty of places out there who can provide that service. In fact, the chamber does offer those kinds of services as does the Small Business Development Center. 
Alicia? Um, thank you. So that answer is great and I'm happy with that, but I also just wanted to add that they did do a similar thing in Springfield where they offered the small business grants to businesses through the ARPA funds. And then they offered free ARPA accelerator courses to help people fill out their applications. And so that if that is something you could look into, I would strongly urge it. Um, if the other things that are available are already free, then maybe just advocating or like making that, making them aware of that, then that would be awesome too. Uh -huh. That's a great okay. idea. Okay. Any other comments on the town manager's report? Any other counselor comments? Dorothy, you have your hand up. I would just say the town manager's report should be required reading. I actually I share it with my constituents, yeah. so. Well, did Paul say at the last meeting there was a way for the public to access them? I want I'm to let sorry, my Jennifer, I can't hear you. I heard your question. Yeah. So the question was, is there a way for public to access? The public uh, town manager reports are put online. Every one of them for the last years is on the town manager page. So you can go back and read them all the, the, the day after. I just wanted to send a link, I guess, to constituents. That yes. would be a way for them to. Yeah, so I, th um, yeah, okay. I, you know, I, I don't know if I put it, I can put it on the town manager report, how to find previous okay. versions. That would be a great idea, yeah. It's also in our packet, which can be accessed through our page as well. Okay. Any other comments from counselors? Seeing none, we are adjourned. It is 1153. Good night, everybody. Talk about a marathon. <laughs>